Well, that's an anticlimactic way to start. Evening, hey. y'all. Hi. Happy Sunday. <laughs> Happy Sunday. Happy bonus stream. Mary Yay. was in here and she was like, I'm going to crash the start of your stream. And here she is. <laughs> uh, hi, Nate. How are you? It's good to see you. Yes, we're doing doing a little departure from the usual like every other week. Let's do some more random stuff because I can. Yes, why not? Oh, I can like hear myself incredibly loudly in my ears all of a sudden for some reason. That's always fun. Have fun. Uh, I'm going away. <laughs> you sure you don't want to learn about CRT displays in Arduino? Oh, my favorite. You have some. <laughs> Bye. Bye, hun. <laughs> uh, delightful. Amazing. Oh, Maureen Lardy says hello. Hey, hi. <laughs> uh, evening, y'all. Yeah, it's good to be here. Oh, you probably haven't. Hang on. I bet that's better. I think that must be significantly better because it actually I put my mic on into onto my body where the mic goes. What is Mary gonna teach a stream? She could teach so many things. Uh, for those who, most of you have met uh, my lovely wife Mary, but if you haven't, she is maybe the world's most organized person, um, as well as being in kind, incredibly kind and generous, and you know a good wife and partner and all these things. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be incredible. I think. Hmm. <laughs> Not gross. It's love. Um, have a fun time. Hi from Belgium. Hi. Hi from Chicago. Worston boy, nice to have you here. Um, we're doing some. We're doing some nerdy stuff tonight, y'all. Um, I mean, I, I assume that's what you're here for. But um, this is uh, this is what we're working on tonight. Um, so it's gonna take some explaining. And in contrast to what we do on like the regular electronics bash weeks. Um, I, uh, this is, this is going to be the casual night where I'm, I'm going to build a thing and talk to you about it while I do it, but there's going to need to be, I think, a fair amount of preamble for what the heck is going on here. But just to give you a little orientation, this is a composite monitor. So I, I lied, I lied just a little bit in like in the header and in the tags. It's not a literal CRT display. It's a composite monitor. And so I have a, a, uh, an actual CRT like television, one that takes like either composite signal or modulated signal, you know, the old boxy tube type one. I was going to use that, and then I realized that uh, that would be kind of a, a bummer to try and get into, like, showing it live. Um, I, the one other time we've used a TV, back when we talked about IR signals coming out of Arduinos, I think I put the TV, like, in the background here and did some the chicanery to get a camera sort of cropped to it. Um, but recently at work, we stripped about 20 of these out of uh, an exhibit at the museum that I work at. And I was like, well, this actually would be, this actually would be much easier to show on a camera because it lies flat on a desk and it's about four inches across. So forgive me for the lies. So the, everything that I'm going to do tonight applies to a CRT display, um, though I'm, I'm going to be using a digitized version just for the sake of being able to sort of contain it on, on the desktop here. <laughs> yeah, Chris. Ah, oh. So something, what is, what is, oh, what is, there we go. I rearranged my Stream Deck controls earlier and now I've confused myself. It's also, I've got the same setup for when I do the Raspberry Pi classes in alternate weeks. But of course, any of the Raspberry Pi buttons, like there's no Raspberry Pi hooked up right now. So it's all very confused. So bear with me as I, as I figure out, you know, how to do a stream again. But that's kind of the point of these casual weeks is like, I don't know. I just, I just hang out and make stuff and you guys watch. And it's fun. And ask questions and let me know what you're thinking. Or for, I, I, this is going to be kind of an involved one. Um... But anyway, the I said I was going to give you a little bit of context before we jumped in, and I shall. So this chip right here is going to kind of be the star of the show tonight. So we can zoom in on it a little bit there. So this is a Motorola MC6847, uh, which is a chip. This one is date-coded 1984. Um, the 31st week of 84, I think, is what that date code is telling us. And given given where I got it, um, that makes sense to me as a date code. The 6884 is uh, a chip that was built into a lot of early, like, personal computers. Um, the TRS-80 kind of being the most popular. Um, it's in the same flavor as, like, the Commodore 64 and a few others. They had slightly more advanced capabilities. The The point of the, the 6847 was... Um, in the early days of personal computing, like this is around about the Apple II time of things, computer monitors were, you know, sort of what we think of as CRT computer monitors were around, but they were expensive, like pretty seriously expensive. But television technology had been around for decades at this point and was somewhat cheaper. So 
uh, some uh, manufacturers who were targeting lower cost solutions made display chips for their little personal computers that they were selling specifically targeted at not computer monitors, but televisions. The real difference there being like resolution and fidelity. Um, and so rather than having to rely on having a uh, a nice looking you know monitor with very nice looking pixels and various things, you have sort of a, a, a cheap, small-ish television that would sit on top of your little, little personal computer box near your desktop next to your five and a half inch floppy drives or maybe your cassette drives or things like that. Um, that's sort of the era that we're talking about. So um, much like this chip would have been outputting to an old crappy TV, I have it outputting to uh, a composite display here sitting on the desktop. And there are fancier chips, there are fancier um, display options, but this is the one I think I'm going to use um, to play around with and hopefully get controlling in some sense with an Arduino by the end of tonight. And I should come clean and say that is an ambitious goal for one evening. Um, so we'll see, we will certainly get to controlling some aspects of it with an Arduino. We'll see how far down this rabbit hole we actually get in one night. Um, I've just sort of gotten us to like the very starting point where it is outputting text to a screen, although it's the same character over and over again, as you may have noticed. Um, so we will, we'll see how far it is productive to get and, and we'll, we'll surely hit some stumbling blocks along the way, yeah? That's what we're gonna do tonight. And if that is sort of hand wavy, that's that's not accidental because um, I'm gonna kind of explain each step as we go. The only thing I wanted to share before we uh, leapt in is that tonight I am drinking a uh, Vida y Muerte uh, from uh, Five Rabbit Brewing Company here in the Midwest. Uh, it is a Muerzen style beer with caramel and spices. It's kind of our, our introduction to the fall. If you are drinking something interesting, I'm always curious to know. If that's just water, that's also great because hydration is important. Um, those who haven't been here before, Worst and Boy, I'm not, Worst and Boy, did you join us last time? I feel like you might have. If you haven't, those who are here regularly know, uh, when I ask for questions, that's really just my excuse to take a sip of beer. So if you have any questions before we start, now's a good time. <laughs> that just tastes like fall. We were looking for pumpkin beer the other day, and we couldn't really find any because a little bit niche, um, but this is like a caramel spiced beer. I'm, not, I'm really digging it for the fall vibes. Um, as always, ask questions as we go along or be like, Jeff, what what the heck are you talking about? Um, but I will dive in and just sort of start to, to mess with this thing. Uh, let's see, Matt, Nate says, how much mass slash design goes into your planning your circuit, selecting resistors, etc." cetera? Mm, good question. So um, where this specific, whoa, I don't know if you, you probably didn't hear that, but I got a big, a big notification. Oh, Windows Defender is telling me it's helping me out. Thanks, Windows Defender. Um, so this specific circuit is more or less out of the, uh, the data sheet for this particular chip. So I have both digitally and on paper, and we'll see which one is sort of more clear to work with in our various situations that we roll along with tonight. Um, but this chip, and you can still find this, this data sheet as a PDF online. I think I linked it in the description as well if you wanted to go through and look at it. But this is the, the data sheet for the Motorola MC6847 non-interlace version, which gives you sort of all the parameters and sort of most importantly what all the pinout for the various chips is. Um, and let's see, what page? Maybe I broke this out already. Um, a lot of data sheets for specialty chips like this will have uh, like a typical application circuit or typical application diagram that's basically saying, hey, you know, this is, there's a lot going on here. Um, you're probably going to want to wire it up something like X. Uh, so this is my this is additional copies here. I think this is the start of the data sheet proper. Um, and... We'll, we'll get deeper into this data sheet as we go, just because that's going to be necessary for understanding what, what the heck is going on here. Um, but here, here's actually a, a decent example. So on page two of the data sheet here, they give us, you know, hey, if you're going to be using this in the 1980s, remember, to control a display, here's something like, you know, not every individual wire, but roughly the components of your system. So here's our MC6847 video display generator. The MC1372 RF modulator, which we're going to talk about in a second, because I'm not using one, but I may at some point be. Um, your, the microcontroller in this case, which I'm going to use in Arduino for, is the MC6809, which is a very popular... If you've heard of the 6502 or the 6802 microcontroller, same family. The 6809 was an evolved version that gave you a few more options and a little bit more local RAM. 
Um, and then there's these uh, some other support chips. You have a ROM I.O. timer, latches, a dynamic RAM in the middle. I'm not going to lay out my system quite like this, but when you're starting to understand what the heck is going on with a chip, something like this is a real, a real gift from the chip manufacturers. We have our table of electronic specifications. I think this one starts with a bunch of pages of... Here, I'm going to scoochy things over a little bit here. There we go. Uh, power, AC memory, a bunch of timing diagrams, which we won't get super deep into, but if you wanted to know, like, how long do you have to hold the voltage on a particular input at a particular level, um, then, uh, this, this timing diagrams will tell you. Let's see if there's a generic block diagram. I feel like there's a sample application circuit. Maybe that one at the front is sort of as detailed as we get, uh, in this basic data sheet. It might be. But in any case, yeah, I think so. That's that looks like as, as detailed as we're going to get. But sort of by going through the data sheet and seeing, okay, what are the what are the relevant pins, what do they do, and sort of what's the most basic version of a circuit that I can create? And then I just sort of laid that out on on the breadboard here. So that maybe is a good chance to introduce what a few of these pins do. I actually I meant to make myself a little cheat sheet version here. And since this is cas casual Sunday, is that fair to say? Since this is casual Sunday. Um, I'm going to do a thing which I had meant to do earlier and just cut out, maybe I'll just rip out um, the pin assignments here just so we can keep them handy. We, all, <laughs> we also just got our printer working again for the first time in months, so I'm kind of reveling in the ability to have printed things uh, <laughs> in the world. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, we'll just rip that off. Okay. So let's put that next to our chip here. Of course, it would be like, oh, it would be like so. And that's going to be a bummer. Here, I'm going to spin the whole kit and caboodle around. Yeah, there we go. All right, so there is the the layout of our chip and its various connections. So let's we're not going to get to all these right away. I'm going to sort of walk through this in steps as we start to mess with this chip a little bit here. Um, so VSS and VDD or, or VCC are important. VCC is uh, your supply voltage in this case, five volts. VSS is your uh, your negative supply voltage or in this case, ground. Um, so I've got pin was it pin 17 is hooked up under here to, that must be this little guy hiding under here, to five volts and ground. Those are first two connections. Those are free. Easy enough. Um, then we have, I need a pointing stick. Here we go. We have a, a large number of pins which control um, the, uh, the sort of mode this is operating in. So things like the AG, AS, invert, internal, external, GM, 0, 1, and 2 all control various ways that this chip is interpreting the data that we're giving to it. And the data that we're giving to it comes in on these eight pins, DD0, DD1, DD2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 3, 4, 5, 6 is back up here, and 7 is on the other side. Um, so, and we'll, I'll explain how that, that data works in a second, what those modes are. Chris says, spun the monitor around and it didn't flip. Oh, Chris, I think I just did this. I think I just translated the monitor from one side to the other. This monitor does have like a flip vertically and mirror settings. Um, these are cute, super cute little monitors. They were built into the back of airplane seats for us. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I don't think it was magic. I think it was just, just, uh, sliding. Um, so I promised to say, okay, so our, our mode settings here, there's a variety of graphics modes that this chip can operate in. The sort of most basic, and the one that's in now, is, uh, alphanumeric mode. And in that mode, the, I think it's only the lower six bits, so D0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, tell the chip to put out a single character onto the screen. And we'll, we'll clarify a little bit what we mean by put out when we talk about more graphics modes. But in this case, you can tell that whatever combination of, you know, uh, data I have set up is causing it to be the letter A. And since that data is never changing, I've, I've literally hardwired some of those pins to ground or to five volts. Um, I'm just, every time that the display needs to put out a new letter, it's A. A, 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 A. And we can see that if I take one of these pins uh, and change it. We'll take, I don't know, I'm just going to pick one at random. But we'll take one of these, you know, data pins that's currently connected here to ground. And I'm just using pliers because these are kind of close together and a little hard to grab. And change it. And we'll see that now the collection of bits that I've identified is the letter I. Uh, we'll change another one. And again, I'm, I'm doing this more or less at random. 
but just to, to drive home the point that these pins are controlling the data going into the device. There we go. Now it is the, looks like a clothes parenthesis symbol. Um, so every time that this device is coming across the screen to draw a new character, um, the, uh, the character that it's drawing is being set by the positions of those eight pins, at least in this alpha numeric mode. Yeah. So here, I should really be, let me highlight these pins as we talk about them, because I think that'll clear up what we still have left to do. That would assume that I have a highlighter handy though, but I do have a yellow Sharpie, which I think will do the purpose. All right, so we've talked a little about these data pins, and like I say, there's more to talk about there. Data pins, we talked about VSS and VCC, which are ground uh, and power supply. Um, the Y pin here is the... <laughs> Highlighter from Mary. If she's watching, she may burst in with one. Uh, I'm sure she has one in her collection of stage management gear behind me here. Um, the Y pin here is the luminance output. And this is worth noting. So this is one thing I've sort of bodged around for now. Um, this device outputs video not sort of straight to the screen, but in three separate components, which are Y, uh, Phi A, and Phi B. Um, if you know anything about composite video, you will know that a standard broadcast television signal, at least back when they were composite, right now they've been digitized in the past few years, would be output as a black and white signal uh, in terms of intensity with an additional signal that communicates color more or less buried within that same signal. That's a hand wavy definition, but the advantage of structuring things that way is that when uh, at least the United States, made the transition from black and white TV to color TV in the 60s, 70s, 80s? 70s, it must have been. Um, someone can correct me on that out there. Um, the older TV sets, the black and white TV sets, could take that exact, that luminance data um, and show a black and white image, and they wouldn't know even to look for this sort of buried color signal. A newer a uh, color TV set would use that luminance component, the sort of brightness component of the image to create an image and then layer in the color component on top of that to create a color image. So you didn't have to have everyone throw out their black and white TVs when we switched to color television, at least here in the United States. Um, from Belgium, I, I believe the system is different. There's a PAL system over there, which was introduced later in the life cycle of television and therefore is a little bit more smartly constructed than the way we do things here in the States because we kind of kludged color in after the fact. Um, but that's what, so the Y, Phi A and Phi B, Y is the luminance. And in fact, that's all we're looking at here. Phi A and Phi B are the, are some of the color components. We would need additional circuitry to combine those in. That's something I've been working on. That's, th that's what this chip hanging out up here is, is part of the color creation system. Haven't gotten that working and I'm not going to focus on it tonight. So for now, we're just having a black and white image. I've actually turned the contrast on this way up and turn the color component way down because here if I turn the color back up for a second you'll see it's still let me turn the contrast down let's see if it's still happening no no it seems to have it seems to so it's not sending out any color information at all at this point we're just getting a black and white image because all of the, of the various bits of control most of them have to do with individual pixels and not with the color of those pixels but I hope to layer that in at some point maybe on a future stream um because like I say I don't know that we'll get to get to everything tonight and this is a fun I've been really wanting to work with this chip for a while now like I think it's a lot of fun um so we'll see if we, if we get to playing with like color things at some point either tonight or in the future I I, I would enjoy that so, uh, we have our data inputs that tell us at this point which letter to put out. We have our output pin, um, and then we have our various modes. The sort of, uh, our mode, one of our mode pins that's the simplest is this invert pin, pin 32. Um, and that just tells us whether we're going to show a, in this case, a white on black image or a black on white image. So let me take pin 32 here. That must be this guy. I'm going to switch it from being attached to five volts to ground. There we go. You can see now we are in, I think this is technically inverted color or non-inverted color i forget which one it thinks is which but now we're we're white on black instead of black on white um i think this may be a little easier to see on camera but so that's an easy one right we can invert our our text at any point um we have our clock pin i'll come back to that in a little bit um yeah, I'm not sure how much, how many more of these we can get into without a sort of slightly more finessed way to control the data coming into this. So I think now's the point where I'm going to start hooking up the Arduino to this because um, I think we're going to need some finer grain control because moving these wires one by one with a tool is sort of a pain. Um, and I think I think we're going to have a, an easier time seeing what's happening if I can manipulate things a little bit more directly. Um, 
So let's write a little Arduino code, yeah? I've got my Arduino Uno here. Plug that in. Ooh, it made a nice bloopy sound in my ears, which I like. Where's that gonna go? Get some of these power supplies out of the way. Oops. Turned off because my, my power supply wire popped out of my little, little gripper. There we go. All right, let's stick that over here somewhere because we're gonna wire it up into this chip. I guess it could live in between, but I think I think having it live over sort of off to the side here and we'll bridge some wires up and over, I think might be the way to go. Um, so let's come over to the computer and we will, there we are, hi. Um, we will boot up the uh, Arduino IDE and write a little bit of code. It's been a while since we've written Arduino code on these streams. It's been several weeks, if not a couple of months. The last file I had open was called Snake Music, which I feel pretty good about. I don't need a new version of Arduino. So let's see here. So what I'd like to be able to do rather than um, attaching the, you know, pulling these wires out by hand and putting them back in with a pair of pliers, I would like to be able to control at least those eight digital input pins um, with, uh, you know, the, the, the input pins on the 6847 with some digital pins on the Arduino. So let's get that set up. Um, let's say we'll use pins, we'll leave our serial port open, so we'll use digital pins 2 through, um, what would be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 2 through 9 connected to those digital pins. So let's set that up as an array. Um, we'll call that our data pins equals 2, 3, 4, 5, I guess, can I do 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 will be the pins of our array. And I'm actually, I'm gonna compile this. It's gonna force me to save. I'll make a new folder for this stream. And I will call this uh, 60, oops. I will call this 6847 control. I think that's how you declare an array. Like I say, it's been a while. We've been writing so much Python code, data pins. Oh, right, I have to declare it as an array. Oof, yeah, it's gonna be a bit of a rocky ride, y'all. Uh, unqualified, oh, no, that's wrong as well. Data pins is an array of eight pins that we will send out data on. Great. All right. So once we have those set up in our setup loop, we'll say uh, for int i equals zero, i is less than eight i plus plus. We'll make a little for loop here and we'll say data pins, uh, let's see, we'll pin mode, data pins i, uh, input pull up. Uh, I guess just input. It, oh, no, no, output. Output. We're driving these pins. Oof. I did say it was gonna be a <laughs> bit of a rocky night. Um, Arduino was back in mid-July. Woof! It's been it's been an age. Um, are we oh where are we? We're over here. Hi. Um, all right. So we'll set up those eight pins as outputs, and then let's see. Let's do something real simple to test this. We'll need to wire it up, of course. Um, and like I say, I think it's only in in um, alphanumerics mode. I think it's only the first six pins that matter. So let's do a little something where we set the value of those pins. Um, what I really would like to do is to be able to say, set those pins to a particular binary value instead of um, sort of uh, individually setting them one by one over time. So let's write ourselves a little helper function first. Um, we'll say void set data pins, um, and that takes an integer uh, called value. Don't put a colon there, that's Python. This is, this is C++, that would not do. Um, let's see, set data pins. Um, and let's see, so this should take um, the, uh, the value that we give it, say from zero to uh, two to the eight, so 256, and set the corresponding data pins to that value. So if we set set data pins with a value of zero, it should turn everything off. With a value of one, it should turn everything off and then turn the first pin on. Value of two, everything off, but the second, you know, sort of turn this integer into a binary value and then put that out on the pins. Um, so what I think I will, I think I will do this as another for loop. We'll loop over all the pins. We'll say for int i equals zero, i is less than eight, i plus plus, oops, plus plus. Open that up. Um, and then um, I would like to say, uh, I'd like each value to sort of be the, the decimal digit of the integer corresponding to that pin. So I'm gonna say digital write, 
uh, let's think about this here. Um, value uh, exclusive or with uh, one left shifted by I. I think that's right. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do this in a, we'll print this in a loop for the time being and just see if his logic is right. Um, so let's see here. Print, let's see. Let's make a little an intermediate value here. Um, we'll call it int value to right equals this value. So this is basically going to extract the particular binary digit, the zeroth binary digit, the oneth binary digit, the toothth binary digit, and so on. I guess oneth and toothth are really first and second, but you know that seems seems complicated. Um, so we'll comment that out there. And before we try to write it out to the pins, we'll just say um, we're going to print uh, value to right. And then after each loop, we will print lin nothing. So we should get eight values in a row. Um, these will actually print from uh, least significant to most significant across our across our display. And then up here in a loop, we will say for uh, int i equals zero, i is less than 64. Uh, and we'll increase i. I will say set data pins i. Uh, is that all going to compile? Let's find out. Probably not. No, I have some typos, of course. Yes, that should be a semicolon in our loop there. Uh, let's see. Oh, that should need a semicolon there. Uh, Oh, and of course, this is not print. This is going, man. You can tell. You can tell. I've been writing a lot of Python because I'm just like, I'll oh, slap a print statement in here and in there. Who cares? But of course, on the Arduino environment, it's going to be a serial uh, dot print statement. We're going to print this out over the serial port back to the computer. All right, let's compile that. And of course, we'll need to initialize our serial port in setup. We'll say serial dot begin uh, at some nice baud rate like, um, oh, I don't know. What are 115200? Sure. 15200. Uh, all right. And in between each of these, we should really uh, delay for a small amount of time. So let's make sure our serial port is set up. Yes, it's auto detected COM3 and COM4. I don't know what COM3 is hooked up to, but the Arduino Uno seems to be on COM4. It is an Arduino or Genuino Uno. Uh, let's upload it and see what happens. We'll see if I've got the logic of this, uh, this outputting right. We're uploading. We're done. All right, let's open our serial port. Ooh. I'm not sure what it's showing me here. <laughs> uh, well, that was exciting. Um, let's see. What have I... What have I goofed? Um... Oh, um, you know, I wanted to print ones and zeros, but of course these values are all going to be um, multiples of two. So I will say if, um, let's see, if, oh, okay, and this should also be value exclusive ord with this shift shift right. This this harkens back to our Arduino lesson on extracting specific bits out of. Um, uh, out of a binary value. I'm doing a kind of a cruddy job of explaining it here though. Value exclusive ord with i left shift to zero bytes and then left shift this right by i minus one, I think. You know what I'm gonna do? And this might be just a little bit embarrassing. I'm gonna go back to my own slides from when I we taught this class uh, and remember how this worked. Um, let's see, that was I think in Neutronics Bash 17 or 18? Let's find out. Uh, let's see. We did register. Ah, so register 18 refers to um, individual. Oh, right, in this BV macro that we talked about. Yes, excellent. We should reuse that. So it wasn't an 18. This is a little bit of uh, a little bit of streamception here, but that's what we get. I mean, it's like I say, this is the casual weeks. Like I, I don't, I have no compunctions about going back and referencing outside material, especially frankly, if it's my own outside. It's I guess is it outside material if it's me? I don't know. I don't. That feels like inside material. Let's see here. I've got exclusive or. Uh, let's see. Set or clear a byte. Bit shift operators. I know I. I'm partly referencing this because I know I put the like specific construction 
Yeah, here we go. So, shift to the left, exclusive or shift to the right, the same number. Okay, I think this is correct. Uh, let's upload that. Uh, we're close. Something is still not right. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, so with value zero, so let's think about this. When we call, this is this, you always are telling me that the troubleshooting is an interesting part. I hope you weren't lying because that's what tonight's going to be about. So let's see here. So we call set data pins with a value of zero and what do we get? Let's, let's just, let's put a big delay in here and we'll see, we'll see what our program is actually doing. So the value of zero, we are getting all ones, which is odd. Uh, so with a value of zero, value to right equals value is zero, exclusive ORD with, uh, how about uh, BVI instead of uh, is that right? Yeah, instead of doing the, the additional left shift. And then I think I'm left, I think I'm right shifting by one too many. I think this should be I minus one. Let's set that back here. Nope, that's clearly wrong. Two should not be in a binary number. That's not how it goes. So what I'm trying to do here, in case I, I haven't explained it properly, is turn a given integer value into a binary value, essentially, so that I can write the individual bits of that binary value out to eight separate digital output pins. Um, and it's clearly there is something not right here. So zero exclusive order with bit value ones. We should be selecting a specific bit out of this byte, right? And so if this was the zeroth bit, and then we should right shift it by zero, and then we should print it out. Hmm, I'm not quite sure what my error is here. Let's let's upload this again. Oops, I have am I missing a parentheses what's happened there yes i don't need that one um let's see here do, do, do. i guess i can also use the built-in arduino get bit functions that might be an easier thing to do huh <laughs> this is now outside this is now outside uh <laughs> outside material bit read there we go. Yes, <laughs> equals bit read, bit capital read, bit read value i. All right, let's try that. <laughs> Making our lives just a little bit easier. I think I remember even when we were talking about that Arduino programming, like back in the day where I was teaching it as a class, I didn't know those bit read values were a thing until after the class was over. Well, so clearly whoever wrote the bit read function is doing it right. So this is what I want to do. And like I said before, um, this is, of course, going least significant to most significant digits. So this is, uh, in the way that this is printing out, this on the left is the ones digit, the twos digit, the fours digit, the eighth digit, and so on. Okay. So that's all right. I'm not actually going to be printing anything. I'm going to be writing that out to a pin. I'm going to digital write to data pin I and value to write. And if you write, if you, uh, you can use, in this case, we normally would use high or low. It, you can also, if you set it to zero, it will be low. If you set it to anything other than zero, it will be high. So this is going to set the value of those pins to low or high, respectively, based on the value that I put in. Um, so now I'm going to need to wire this these eight pins up, pin digital pins two through nine, to the inputs on the 6847. And then we'll finally sort of be back in what I imagine is a more interesting place um, where we're running a little bit of code and having it do things on the display. This is sort of, so uh, this morning I was noodling around with this display because I figured like there was a decent chance I wouldn't actually get this display to work at all. Um, in which case this would be a very boring stream. Um, like I, I, I hope that the troubleshooting is interesting in some way, but I feel like in a visual medium without anything to look at at all, that would be pretty sad. So I spent a good deal of time, you know, making, uh, getting to this point, essentially. Um, 
And now I realize there are a couple more points like, you know, getting the basics of the Arduino code working that are also not particularly visual. Um, but we will be back to visual experimentation very soon. So let's get out our cheat sheet here and I will, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire up these pins sort of in the order that they appear physically on my cheat sheet. And then I'm going to change the code um, so that, you know, the pin six is followed by pin zero and so on. Um, just so I don't have the wires crossing all over each other. I'm going to kind of keep them in linear order wiring wise, and then I'll change the code to match that, if that makes any sense. Um, so let's start with, uh, my power supply is off. I'll of course remember to turn it back on later, like I always do. So pin digital pin seven is going to be connected to Arduino pin nine. Uh, data pin six is going to be connected to Arduino pin eight. Data pin zero is going to be connected to Arduino pin three. Oh, no, no, uh, data pin zero connects to Arduino pin seven. Data pin one. This really would be the like the opportunity for an ASMR segment tonight, I feel like. Data pin one is connected to Arduino pin six. Data pin two is connected to Arduino pin five. Arduino pin five. <laughs> uh, I do have a good time here. I'll maybe may mix up the colors of these wires a little more in case we have to in case we have to do any more significant troubleshooting on the wiring end of things. Let's see, so I've got four there, data pin six, zero, one, two, data pin three. Oh, that's a long one. I can save that for an, a longer stretch of cabling. Uh, data pin four connects to Arduino pin four. Data pin five connects to... <laughs> Chris says, place your bets now for power supply. Assuming I'll remember to turn it. The nice thing is, if I don't turn, at least about this circuit, is if I don't turn the power supply on, it becomes clear very quickly that nothing is happening. Um, so we will we will see if, I mean, listen, you're not wrong. Like, I, that's, that's not a thing I'm good at remembering. But I, I stand, I think, a decent chance tonight of all nights. Okay, so now I've got those eight pins wired up. I'm going to go back to the Arduino code and we'll make that initial array of pins match the order that the pins actually got wired up in here. Um, so let's come back to the computer. All right, so these are going to represent um, DD0, DD1, and so on through DD7. Uh, so let's just get rid of all that. So DD0 here uh, is connected to Digital here. I'm gonna make this a little, just a little bit easier on myself and transcribe them here, and then we will we'll transcribe them into code. So pin seven uh, is connected to Arduino pin nine, pin eight. Yeah, this is a lot easier. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, and two. So then I gotta read them out in in order of the uh, the pencil numbers and put in the uh, is that what I want? No, I'll read them out in order of D0, D1, D2, and put in the penciled in numbers. That's what I mean to say. So in this case, D0 is attached to pin 7. Uh, D1 is pin 6. D2 is pin 5. D3 is pin 4. 3, 2, 8, 9. Okay. So now with that all wired up, and I will plug this back in. Chris, you're not helping with the numbers. Um, I will, in theory, if I upload this code and I turn both of the power supplies back on, and by that I mean plug the power supply for the screen back in. Um, oops, of course, commenting in, I'll show you over here, commenting in C++ is two slashes. It's not a pound sign like I had because I've been writing in Python for weeks and weeks. <laughs> Oof. All right, let's come back here. So now, so that's plugged in, power supply turns back on. Yeah, there we go. So now this is cycling through 
every possible character that this screen can display. Let me slow this down just a little bit so we can see a little bit better what we're seeing here. It's gonna do all kinds of janky things as I'm uploading, right? So I get, I get all the capital letters first, A through Z. Right, then I get some punctuation, brackets, arrows, the space is in there, dollar sign, uh, plus, comma, slashes, here come the numbers. Colon equals some math signs, and then we're back around to the beginning. And all of those are nicely documented for us in a cozy little chart in the data sheet here. And we're, this, this will show, no, Chris, I was wrong, no lowercase at all. You only get... Uh, what is it, 16 times 4, so 64 characters, and it's those. So, uh, no care, or at symbol, A through Z, uh, various punctuation, dollar sign, and math, um, 0 through 9, and a few more punctuation. And that's it. And then this is showing that, like, you can have the inverted character version as well. Um, which we could actually, we could look at as well. Why don't we continue wiring up things into the circuit board so we get some additional control? So, power supply off. Um, why don't we hook up the invert line to its own data pin? This is where some of these uh, these nice long wires will come in handy. So I am going to hook up, let's say in the invert line is going into Arduino pin 10. Arduino, oops, there's, there's some, <laughs> there's an old bit of wire stuck in my digital pin 10. You're, I, I doubt you're going to be able to see this on camera, but I've got to try and show you because it's, pretty funny so right down inside my my tent you can see a little dot of silver there that's there's an old bit of wire stuck down there so maybe that's maybe not pin 10 it, maybe that's not the right choice maybe it should be pin 11 <laughs> after 18 weeks of arduino classes these have seen some better some better days uh let's see here uh so the invert line is pin 32 so that would be this guy so let's pop that out and replace it with another control line yeah all right so that's now wired up let's make use of it in our code now we're gonna start jamming now that everything's like basically wired in um so i'm going to say um int invert just define that pin there uh equals pin when i say 11 um, let's call this, let's call this pin inv, um, and that's just going to match up with the, oh, that's my face, we're just going to match up with the, like, pin abbreviation that's on the data sheet here, just to keep it a little more clear. So pin invert equals pin 11, um, and I will say, now here's, here's kind of a design question that I've been thinking about, is do I need to have a variable for each of these pins that stores their current state? And I don't necessarily know that I need to because um, be I'm really what I'm trying to avoid is a situation where to like to update this like the state of the invert pin, I need to both update that variable and then write that variable out to the pin. And that feels like doing the same thing twice. And that feels like an opportunity for streamlining some things. So I think what I can say is um, in my setup here, I'm going to say... Uh, pin mode, pin invert, um, output, digital write, pin invert, high. Um, so this should, this should not change anything that we can see on the display. So we'll upload that code here and drifting out of frame there. Turn the power supply back on. Let's zoom out a little bit here. We should have exactly the same thing with the black, black on white text over here. We can see that a little better. There we go. Um, so that's good. So now we have control of that pin, though. I should be able to do something like um, in our main loop here, I will say, uh, so we're looping over all the values, and I will say uh, int current invert equals digital read pin invert. Um, and let's see. Uh, current invert equals not current invert. I'm not sure this is a totally valid operation, but let's find out. Digital write to the inverse pin, uh, the value of this current invert variable. What I'm trying to do is basically, you know, invert the state of the 
the invert pin, if you will, every time we go through this loop. So we'd see all 64 characters um, in their black on white state, and then we'd see all 64 characters in their white on black state. And not 100% sure if this logic's going to hold, but got our... Because I can do this if we have a variable to hold that state. Like, again, it just seems like overkill. If we get back to A and things haven't changed, we'll know that I've goofed this up. I'm going to reduce this delay back down now that we get the get the idea. Oh, there we go. There we go. So now we're cycling through black to white, white to black. So now we've controlled that invert pin. Um, we can change the, the sort of display of the individual colors there, which is great. Um, so now let's wire up a couple more control pins and I can explain a little bit more about what they do. Why don't we wire up, uh, should we do the graphics mode pin? Let's do the semi graphics pin. So pin 34 here switches back and forth between, uh, what's called, uh, alpha and, uh, alphanumeric and semi graphic modes. And I have a cheat sheet to explain what the heck a semi graphic mode is. Um, basically, so right now we're, we're putting in eight bits of data, which this, uh, chip is using to determine which letters to display. And of course it's changing slowly enough. You know, this is updating 60 times a second. So it's sweeping over all of these individual letters very, very, very quickly. Um, so quickly that we're not, you're not changing which letter we're displaying in between each one. Although hopefully we will get there by the end of this evening or the end of a future, future part of this project. Um, let me see here. Sorry, I'm trying to talk and find a page in a data sheet at the same time. Um, so, yeah, so the, here's our, a summary chart of which mode we were in based on our various settings pins. So we've been in 0, 0, 0, 0, alpha, nu alpha numerics mode, alpha numerics mode, internal versus external, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we've seen inverted and not inverted. You can also do external alphanumerics. Like I said, we'll talk about that later. Let's look at semi-graphics mode four and semi-graphics mode six. Um, so in addition to just displaying text, this chip has the ability to do some very basic graphics. Um, let me find the page that illustrates this. Yeah, so in... This, so th what this chart is telling us is what the eight bits that are coming into the uh, the data pins at any point are telling the screen to do. So in alphanumerics mode, internal, it's telling some of the pixels within the middle of each block. So this is representing a block of eight pixels by 12 pixels. Um, and within the sort of center of each block, it will display a letter based on those eight bits. Um, in alphanumeric external, which we'll see in a little bit, you sort of have a, a, a greater ability to define which of those pixels are referenced by those 8 bits, but it needs some external hardware. Semi-graphics mode, we basically, we're going to use those 8 bits to determine which of some giant blocks of those pixels are illuminated and also in what color. Um, like I say, we're not hooked up for color yet, but rather than using those 8 bits to say, you know, okay, I mean A, I mean B, I mean C, in this case, those 8 bits are going to reference which of uh, these four chunks, these four large chunks of, of elements, which I guess must be, since this is representing the same chunk of image as this is, this must be a six pixel by four pixel chunk of the screen will be illuminated or not and in what color. We also have semi-graphics mode six, which only allows you to have four colors, but gives you four by four pixel blocks. So not a particularly precise graphics mode, that's why this is called a semi-graphics mode. Um, but again, we're, we're just using those same eight bits that we were using to write uh, sort of letters to the screen, and now starting to use them to define other structures. So let's wire in the semi-graphics mode switch, which I think is going to require actually two new pins. Let me find that chart again, that very nice chart. It's going to tell me which pins I need. I'm going to hold on to that page. I'm going to hold on to this much more detailed page, which I think will be helpful. And find that chart here. Nate, I, I guess this whole evening is going to kind of be an answer to the question of like how much design goes into these things. Um, Cause we're kind of, 
kind of developing this on the fly, which I think is is kind of my at goal is a really strong word, but like why I thought it might be fun to do these more casual Sundays is, you know, I really, <laughs> I try, although you've seen how I do, I try to hold it together on the class weeks, like sort of know what's going on and have everything planned out. Um, but these weeks it's fun to be able to sort of show like the process of building something together, I think. I hope you think it's fun too, but I certainly do. So let's see. So I'm going to need to set the AS pin to zero to one um, to do semi-graphics mode. And also it'd be nice to have a control of the internal or external pin. So let's wire both of those up to the Arduino. So let's see here. Using my little cheat sheet, um, I need to control the AS pin, which is pin 34. We'll pop out its little jumper here. Um, I wire that up to pin 12. Let's let's write that into the code before I forget. So that'll be pin 34. I actually could write it on here as well. That'll be Arduino pin 12. Inverse was 11. If we come back over to the computer, um, we will say pin, uh, int pin, what was that? AS equals 12. And I know already int pin, um, int internal external. That's kind of a, a kludgy variable name, but I think that'll be all right. It's going to be wired up to 13. So we come back over here, fit one more of our longer wires, and we'll wire digital pin 13 on the Arduino up to uh, internal external is here pin 31, just below the invert pin. So that must be this guy. All right, so those both had been tied low. So if um, sad number 10 is still left out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, until I get in there with a, my nice sharp set of pliers, it's gonna be a little bit sad. Um, what I, let's see, well, we can just do this manually. So we'll say pin mode, uh, pin AS is an output, digital write, uh, pin AS low. So we'll, so we'll, again, as you've heard me say before, my preferred way of um, adding new features is to first use those features to duplicate the thing you already have going and then build new functionality from there, right? So these two lines, the alpha graphics or semi graphics pin and the internal external had just been tied to ground with those little wires we just took out. So I'm gonna first start by setting them to low so we shouldn't see any behavior change this time. And that's how we know we will have understood what we have already done. Um, so in theory, things should look just exactly the same. And they do, yes. So we should have our, our white on black and black on decks going through great. So why don't we start by, if we look at our, our cheat sheet of modes here, why don't we start by turning on semi-graphics mode four? So we leave internal and external, uh, the internal external pin at low, but we'll bring the AS pin high. So let's, let's just see what happens there. So just back over in the code, I'm just gonna set it high um, and not toggle it, and we'll just we'll sort of see what happens. Let's upload that. And come back over to the table because you know what an uploading Arduino code looks like. Yeah, there we go. So now we are so we're still cycling through the 64 possible combinations of eight bits that we have here. Um, but now instead of telling the controller to turn those into letters and numbers, we are cycling through. Um, Really, the, in, what we have is the 16 possible permutations of illuminated chunks of four pix, of four by four pixels, or I guess four by six pixels, inside one of those display elements, right? So this is the sort of element size that each, each a block that those bits are operating on, and those bits are telling each of these elements to either be on or off. I think what's happening is actually when you can see the brightness is changing very significantly over time, I think that's because it's trying to form these various different colors that it has access to that we just can't see yet. Maybe we should get color, we, we will definitely get color running at some point, I just don't know that we will get to it tonight. Um, so that's semi-graphics mode four. So just by changing the state of one pin, we now have sort of a very rudimentary graphics mode on here. And again, every one of those blocks currently is doing exactly the same thing because we're not updating our display fast enough. That is still to come. Um, I just want to sort of explore the various graphics modes and then we'll build in the hardware that actually sort of like puts an image or some text on the screen, I hope. 
Um, so that's semi-graphics mode four. Let's do semi-graphics mode six. And to do that, I just need to turn the, um, the interior exterior pin from low to high. So let's do that. We'll upload, come back to the table. It's gonna freak out as I upload. Yeah, there we go. So this might be a little bit harder to see what's going on, but now we're operating on chunks of elements that are sort of two by three. So our individual blocks are are smaller and we're still cycling through the, the 64 various possibilities of how those blocks could be illuminated. Again, so this in theory is a four color mode and I think we can see that the brightness is changing maybe. I'm actually not 100% sure that it is. Um, we, should, we would go and look at and see in semi-graphics six mode how color was being referenced. Curious. Uh, neat. So just for the sake of exploring it a little bit further before we, uh, we go all the way down the rabbit hole and, and start getting this thing controlled by an Arduino, let's look at the actual graphics modes. So in addition to alphanumerics, in addition to semi graphics modes, we get various resolutions of graphics modes. And I guess it's important to say, the, the reason that this gives you so many different options is this chip is, like I say, from the 80s. It's from an era where you would have, you know, if you had, 8K of RAM in your personal computer, that was a big deal. 16K, are you kidding me? What a what a dream. You might have, your computer might ship with four kilobytes of RAM and you might get you know an expansion cartridge that you'd plug into the back that would have an additional maybe 12 or 16K. Maybe take you up to 64K when things started getting really fancy in the late 80s. Um, but we're really constrained in terms of how much we can actually cause our microcomputers to remember. And so having a device like this that needs a, you know, a relatively small amount of memory and control lines that gives you a lot of options for how your display is being controlled can be really useful, right? With just sort of eight bits of control, we can now say, okay, sometimes I'm gonna want my programs to output like letters and numbers. Sometimes they're gonna need some big chunky graphics. And if I wanna throw a lot of memory at it for a specific application, I can throw a relatively high resolution graphics mode at it if I really want to. Um, so let's, you tell you what, let me wire up these additional control lines I'll need, GM0, GM1, and GM2, which set, once we're in graphics mode, that will sort of set how much resolution we're going to have in those graphics modes. So I actually need to wire up the alpha, alphanumerics and graphics mode pin, and then these three pins to control which of the graphics modes we're in. So let's do that now. Um, so let's come back over. I guess I zoomed you way in to see that thing. We'll just get this wired up. Might need some slightly longer wires, in which case I will make them. That is the wrong kind. Okay, so using our cheat sheet here, uh, we will wire up, let's see, I need to wire up the AG pin, pin 35. So that'll be pin A0 on the Arduino. And this is the thing I, I'm sure I have said before, but it's important to know, you can use what we think of as the analog pins as an, on an Arduino as digital inputs and outputs, just like any of the rest of them. They, they refer to them as analog pins just because they are, you know, um, they have analog input capabilities, but they are also just generic digital IO pins. So don't think you're limited to just the 14 on sort of the right hand half of the board. So AG is going to be in what we would call analog zero. And then I have my GM zero, GM one, and GM two that also need to get wired in. So, well, that's, well, there we go. So GM zero is pin 30. So that's just below my interior exterior pin. Ooh, and that wire is not really gonna be long enough there. Let's try that again. A0, or A1, I guess, is going to go to pin 30. I guess that's pin 30. Is that right? I'm just going to count. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So GM0 is in Arduino pin A1. GM1 is going to be in Arduino pin... A2, and GM2 is going to be in Arduino pin A3. I think I'm out of my longest set of jumper wires, but that's all right. 
I my, my father-in-law handed off to me another one of those like giant Arduino like sensor sets again a few weeks ago. So I guess thank you to uh, the Hungerfords for sponsoring uh, <laughs> lots of nerdy adventures here. But in it came a bunch of these uh, these Dupont wires, which have been so helpful. Um, all right, so that's going to go into pin A. Okay, so let's wire that into some code, and we will play around with our graphics modes. So I'm going to need uh, pin AG is uh, a zero, and pin GM, use my cheat sheet here, GM zero is a one, int, uh, let's see, GM zero, int GM one is a two, and int pin GM2 equals A3. I think it'll let me do the assignments this way. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, so I think what I'm going to do here um, is just wrap up all of these various control pins into their own array just to make it a little bit easier to, like, treat them as a clump. Um, and I, in no particular order, because I'm never going to really iterate through them. Um, but it'd be nice just to be able to say, hey, everything that's a control pin that I defined so far, um, do, do something with. In this case, I'm thinking that we'll use this array to set them all to be, um, outputs. So in this case, rather than doing this pin mode output for every, every single pin, I think it's going to be cleaner to say, um for int i equals zero, i is less than seven in this case, and I really should define that up above. In fact, let's do that now. Um, we will say num num control pins equals one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think we've looked at before the construction that allows you to do that dynamically, but I'm gonna be lazy about it. Num control pins, uh, and I will say pin mode um, control pins, I output. So this is why I wanted to wrap those all in a big array is that now I can just do one loop over all of them and make them all outputs. And now I can have my state, sort of uh, all these lines that define what state they're in right next to each other. So let's see, I wanted this to be in graphics mode. So let's, we're gonna set our, our graphics mode high. It's not gonna matter actually in this case what our, our AS, our internal so and inverted pins are. Those are not used in defining the graphics modes. And then we'll just explore what these various resolutions do as we change the, the states of our graphics mode pins. Let's say it's fun. I to be totally candid. So I have been looking forward to do like playing with this chip for a while, and I've been you know working on it this weekend to get things sort of to the basic state they were in. This is the first time that I am seeing this all happen on the screen. I know a lot of times on on the stream it's like, oh, I've done this before. Now I'm gonna sort of do it again and show you how it works. This is all new to me. I'm I'm doing this live as it were, and I'm I'm stoked about it because I think this is a lot of fun. Um, it's just, it's cool to have a chip from the '80s. Controlled by an Arduino from like the from 2018 on a screen. I just I'm having a great time. Um, so let's code this in, and then we will we will get this thing running. So I guess in this case it doesn't actually matter what these three pins are, but we'll just leave those lines there for now. So we'll say digital write pin uh, graphics mode high, and then let's start by. Um, GM zero. We'll set these all to. We'll start with the lowest resolution graphics mode. Um, so all three of our graphics mode select pins will be low. So now if I upload that, yes, and I turn on my power supply. Thank you. Yeah, we get some real fun, some real fun graphics, some real high tech graphics. So, so what the heck is happening here? Ooh, if you zoom in far enough, we can kind of see individual pixels there, which is kind of fun. Um, so in these graphics modes, we have a variety of ways that, again, our same eight bits of data that are going into the device that are sort of cycling through their various um, different possible options, some various parameters for how those bytes can be turned into visual data. This might be a little bit clearer to do on the digital version of the data sheet, and I see how how crunky that, um, that printed version is on that particular page. But if we go to that page digitally, yes, and we rotate so we can actually see things, I guess it's not much less crunky uh, in the digital version. But 
let's see here. What we're looking at is semi graphics mode, semi graphics mode, color graphics one. So we are in what mode are we actually in? We are in color graphics one, CG one mode. So what do our bits do? What are our eight bits that are showing up here? What do they do in color graphics mode one? So color graphics mode one uses a maximum of one kilobyte of display RAM. Um, in which one uh, pair of bits specifies one picture element. So it's going to suddenly I've got uh, bits C1, C0, C1, C0, C1, C0, C1, C0. So each of those pairs of bits is specifying the color of a chunk of pixels that is in this case four pixels wide by three pixels tall. So I have, you know, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Each of those is specifying a specific color that that chunk of pixels on the screen can be. And we're gonna repeat that, that those elements chunk by chunk over the course of a single line of these chunks. Then we would skip down to the next line of the screen and the next set of bits that we look at would define this. And again, because we are not changing the data particularly rapidly, that is going to be the same repeated set of pixels all the way across the screen. Um, but if we were changing these bits rapidly, which I hope to do in a little bit, um, we would be able to have sort of different collections of pixels at various points on the screen. Um, and again, we also, like, you know, this, these would be different colors. Right now they're showing up as different brightnesses, um, which is still kind of interesting. Um, and we can see that depending on the state of the uh, CSS pin, which is the color select pin, our colors can either be uh, green, yellow, blue, and red, or buff, cyan, magenta, and orange. Um, those are the color options that we get in our four color mode here. Not a particularly pretty mode for drawing things in, I think, in either mode. Um, but that's kind of a fun thing to play with. So all of these, these various graphics modes allow you to sort of make trade-offs between whether the data represents um, more and more specific chunks of pixels or more and more specific colors. So here in color graphics mode one, we get one of a set of four colors and the pixel blocks are four by three. In resolution graphics mode one, we get, I think, just two colors. Yeah, black, and they can be black green or black and buff, which is kind of a tan. Um, but our pixel chunks are three by three. Um, if we go up a little further, we color graphics mode two, right? Still the same, uh, you know, a number of, of bits and still four colors, but our pixels, our, our chunks of pixels are smaller. Um, but of course, to store more data to represent those pixels, we would need to use more bytes of RAM in our microcomputer's memory, right? So, for example, color graphics mode two would use two kilobytes of memory to display chunks of this size in four colors and so on. So let's take this to the logical extreme. Let's go up to resolution graphics mode six in which the, the chunks are one of two colors, but they're only one by one pixel wide. So in that situation, all of my graphics mode control pins are high. And that really is the thrust of what this what this chip is allowing you to do is allowing you when you're building one of these microcomputers to make trade-offs between how much RAM you're using to store the state of the image on the screen um, versus what you what, versus like the resolution and the color data of what you're displaying. Um, so if you only have, you know, 512 bytes to spare, you can still have a text display or very limited graphics. If you can spare, I think this mode uses six kilobytes, you can have a fairly high, you know, for the standards of the time, resolution display. You just might be eating up a fairly significant chunk of the RAM in your microcomputer to do it. I need to take a drink of my beer, partly to celebrate like how stoked I am that this is working. Like I say, I have not tried this before. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled that it's behaving exactly as advertised. So questions if you got them, comments if you got them. I'm drinking my beer. I'm delighted. Give me one sec. That is a dangerously drinkable beer. It's like, like kind of sweet, which I like. I do like sweet things. Um, so that's that's going to be a that's going to be a challenge to have in our fridge for the next few weeks. Okay, questions if you got them. I know there's latency. I'll see them at some point soon. Um, what I think I need to do now is so you know th this is a this is fun. This is a fun demo and it's working out fine. 
it's not really much of a data display, is it, right? Like this is not, it, it's interesting, but it's not particularly useful. What we really want to be able to do is um, change the bits that are going into this display controller fast enough that we could have say a different letter in each spot or a different collection of pixels lit or not lit say. Um, how are we going to possibly do that? How are we going to synchronize our data fast enough? How are we going to get data onto the screen fast enough that is actually making the display? Well, I keep throwing around the idea that you are using different amounts of RAM uh, to store the data that is being uh, referenced by this display. And when I say RAM, you're probably picturing something like you have in a modern PC, which is a, you know, a stick of probably DDR RAM that might be, you know, anywhere from a gigabyte to eight or 16 gigabytes. But in this case, RAM refers to <laughs> another physical chip. So this is the HM6264. I see this is an eight kilobyte RAM chip. The 64 in 6264 refers to uh, 64,000 bits um, or eight kilobytes. So that's an eight kilobyte RAM there um, that uh, we're going to use to store some data that we're then going to display on the screen. So how exactly we're going to do that, I will show you in a second here. But I think first, yeah, a whole eight kilobytes. It's totally wild. I think, I don't know if I pulled, I, I pulled a little collection of things out of my collection here. Oh yeah, so this one, here's an HM6116. Uh, so that's 16,000 bits or two kilobytes in a chip this size. One little fun side note. So um, the these were a fairly common product for a while and they were superseded by these. This is a 24 pin package. You can see it's a couple pins shorter than the other. This is a 28 pin package. A lot of devices actually were made that could use either. And so the lowest, say 24 pins on the larger chip are exact matches to the smaller chip. So you could, you know, if you had a device that was usable with a, uh, a 64 bit, 64 kilobit RAM, you could use a 16 kilobit RAM um, and you just wouldn't get the top, you know, the rest of the memory. So the power pins are in the same place, the address and the output pins are in the same place. Um, they just sort of tacked on four more address pins to allow you to address more data. So sort of fun there. Um, so I think what we will do, because this is going to need some rewiring, I'm going to need to take some time to wire up this RAM chip and then we will test it and then we will wire that in to the display part afterward um, and get that working. I wonder if I should wire this into a separate Arduino as a place to test. I do have one here and I have a lot of wires. I might do that. Um, let me grab another breadboard here. I might, I don't know if I have to do tummy cam to get it. I have my breadboards just here. Ooh, or if my mic cable will be long enough. Stand by. All right, with my mic cable freed, I think I can still talk to all of you nice folks while I grab a spare breadboard out of breadboard storage here. Breadboard storage is also where I keep all of the old projects from um, uh, from the electronics bash classes in the early days. So like I have like our snake game, I have like the servo demo board in there, like from the, the point in time where I was like, I don't know, maybe we'll like redo these someday. And I still kind of think that sometimes, um, hopefully like not during the next pandemic, but you know, just in general. Um, all right, we're back, thanks for waiting. So what I've got here, let's shift this Let's turn a couple things off. We'll shift this out of the way. We'll get another Arduino in place. Um, and we will get it wired up. So let's just, let's chonk this, this guy on the breadboard. It is going to need, let's see. It's going to need some power and ground. So we'll get those wired in. I'm just gonna use a little bit of, I think I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but my preferred breadboarding wire um, is a uh, 22 gauge doorbell wire or bell wire it's often called. Um, Cause you can get it, it, you know, it comes in, in white and, and red. I'm gonna show you on this camera here down here. Uh, typically white and red twisted together and it's super cheap. Um, and it's just the right size for building things on a breadboard. Um, not too big, so it like destroys things, not too small, so it slips out. Um, and it's solid core. You really don't wanna be breadboarding with stranded wire. That is a total, 
total bummer. All right, so we'll just, for the sake of experimentation, we will just use the uh, Arduino's 5-volt regulator as the power supply here. Oh, Chris makes a very good point. Yes, bell wire is available everywhere. It's very common um, and will last, you know, I, I think I have a 500-foot spool of it that's lasting me years at this point and will, will last me years more. So one thing I'll need is an data sheet uh, or Walmart for late night projects does this. That's, that's fun. Uh, let's see. Let's pull up our data sheet here. Now I'd really like to download it so I can reference it just a little bit bigger. Yeah, okay, so here we go. So this is the data sheet for the RAM that we are going to use. And why don't I, I'll tell you what, I'm just gonna open it in my PDF viewer because I think that view will be a little bit cleaner. Uh, there we go. Yes, the HM6264. Uh, so 8,192 word by 8-bit words, high-speed static CMOS RAM. Amazing. Fast access time, low power standby, 0.1 milliwatt, incredible. So all so fancy. Um, what I really want though here is the pinout so we can start to wire this thing up. Okay, so why don't we come over here? Yes. Um, so one thing I'm going to need to want to do is bridge the power rails on either side of my breadboard because of course by default those are not connected to each other. I'm also going to, I don't need to tummy can this, I have, oh, it's right here. Speaking of giant spools of bell wire, I'm just gonna cut myself off a hunk so we can build some wires with it. So one thing I will do here as I was saying is bridge the power and ground rails on <laughs> Does this will it say maintenance only? I believe that. I I can't imagine anyone's building new products with these in these in uh these days in 2020. Although some of these kinds of chips are still being you know manufactured by a few select manufacturers because there is still ancient hardware running them. I think a lot of that is I I don't know, but I suspect a lot of that is and not specifically these RAM chips is driven by the military. Right? Like if you have a, a spy plane that was built in the 70s that still uses really ancient hardware and you can pay a manufacturer, you know, umpty kazillion to continue making a hundred of them a year and maintain that product line, you might, right? Like it might be worth it to you. I, I don't know. That's, that's purely speculation. Um, but I, I think that might be what's going on. So my data sheet here, let's see. So the, I'm a couple of easy ones here. Power, that one's easy. Ground must be somewhere. Yes, VSS is ground. We'll ground that out. Okay. So now we're going to have to wire this thing up. And let me see if I have even enough control lines to do it. So I need uh, for my... Here, I'll, sh I'll show you what I'm thinking about. So to drive the data lines of the display here. So I, this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but to give you a little... Um, peek at what's coming down the pipe. So the uh, the our, the RAM has um, address lines, right, that are going to specify a particular byte in memory. And then we're going to use its eight data lines to write eight bits or one byte into that place in memory. The display controller, the, you know, this, this MC6847 we've been playing with also has address lines. Um, so the intention is that you use your microcontroller to write some data to some volatile memory, to some RAM, which later the, the display controller can similarly set an address in that RAM and read that data out. And what I'm thinking about is how many address lines I'm going to need. I believe this has uh, 13 address lines, and this has... 13 address lines. Good. That makes sense. That tracks because this, this, the, uh, the display chip can use up to eight, up to six K of Ram. And this is an eight K Ram. Um, and I've got eight IO lines plus maybe a couple of select lines. Am I going to have enough pins on the Arduino to actually do this in full form? Or am I going to have to like limit how much memory I can use? So I have 13 control lines, eight data lines. So that's 21 control lines and the Arduino has 20 minus control. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I think what I'm learning is I'm not going to be able to directly with the Arduino pins I have available, do the, um, all these lines at once, unless, unless 
I happen to have an Arduino Mega in my jump box. All right, stand by. I see my Arduino bin. Let's pull this puppy down and see if we happen to have what we need. All right, we're back. Oh, Nate says, wish we could, <laughs> wish we paid to keep old parts available. Too many times we just stop supporting the parts while still flying the aircraft. Nothing ever breaks? That's amazing. I want to work in your industry, Nate, where nothing ever breaks. That sounds fantastic. Hey, there we go. I have one, or at least one Arduino Mega in the big bin O Arduino E microcontroller -y stuff. That's going to solve my problem. Oh, well, bonus Tommy Cam. That's just for you super fans out there. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, so get out of here, Arduino Uno. Get in here, Arduino Mega. So we will wire that <laughs> power and ground back up here. All right, and now we will begin the process of wiring the <laughs> fluid in sarcasm. You're my kind of people, Nate. Um, of wiring the various address and data lines up to this RAM. And for that, I'm gonna use, I think, these pre-made jumper cables. Because while they are kind of annoyingly short, it means I won't be cutting 21 individual wires uh, while y'all wait for me. I might have to cut a few. I don't, I don't know that I have quite enough. Oh, hello. That's something else. So, and we'll, we'll take note of these as we go, I suspect, because that's gonna be the only way to keep this sane. So let's wire up the various address. Oh, hello. <laughs> Bit of a camera cable hanging out there. Um, why don't we wire up the various address lines first, I think. Um, so those address lines, I'm thinking here, are kind of down both sides, but mostly on the left-hand side here. So I think I'm going to use the uh, these first digital pins here to wire up. Uh, let's make sure that's right. So, pin 13 goes to 12. All right, I should be really should be writing this into code as we go. So let's start a new Arduino program. So we we'll figure out what it does later, but we will just say, um, how are we gonna denote this? Let's just do it in a comment, and we can figure out how the formatting works later. So this will be Arduino pin uh, followed by the RAM pin. So Arduino digital pin 13 uh, is RAM pin uh, A12. Let's see here. And get that split screen action going. Yeah, there we go. So that'll be A12. Uh, digital pin 12 goes to A7. Oh, um, let's see. Is that interesting? Yeah, I don't, there's nothing, there's not, I will confess, not a whole lot to see on either <laughs> a location, the desk or the screen at this point, but I mean, maybe, maybe that's a little bit more interesting. So digital pin 11 is A6. Digital pin, I guess this way you're not looking at the side of my head most of the time, so that's good. 10 is a five digital pin nine is a four i guess you're still getting a little bit of side of head cam let's see here while I'm wiring this up, I'm mean to ask Chris. I, I know you're out there tonight. How was uh how is Christmas lights coming along for you this year, Chris? Chris is I, uh, Chris does a a long stretch of Christmas light preparation each year um, that I'm always very jealous of, and I I'm hoping this year is no exception, Chris. I don't know if you're taking anything differently because you know of the year that it is. D seven is a two. D six is what is a one i can see why ben eater if you don't follow ben eater e-a-t-e-r on youtube um any of you nerds would love his channel he builds breadboard computers i can see why he does this in advance not if he doesn't stream them he records videos um and uh and plays them back 
listening and trying to reprogram my shows the same. More pixels, yes. Always more pixels, yes. Your pixels are got to be somewhat brighter than the ones I've got here tonight, Chris, I suspect. Oh, so that should be A0. So it should be four pins left on the bottom. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I didn't screw that up. So a few more address pins to wire up. And these I might have to cut from, from bell wire here. So we will say D4 is going to go to address pin eight. So that's what? One, two, three, four from the top. One, two, three, four from the top. Thinking of turning down the brightness. Chris, what, uh, what are, are you mostly WS 2812s these days or are there more, more sexy modern variants? So we, I don't think we ever talked about, um, Neo pixels here on the channel. Um, except maybe in passing. Um, but for those who haven't encountered them, um, NeoPixels or WS2812s or their various family of things are a super cool um, individually controllable LED that takes basically, it, it solves the old, old problem of, okay, I have, I want to control 500 LEDs with my Arduino, but I don't have 500 signal lines to like do pulse modulation on each of them. What do I do? So WS2811s and 2812s and 2850, they're all, its whole family of 2800 um, chips um, solve that problem by basically you string them together in serial. It's sort of one after the other. And there's a protocol that you can send out at very high speed, like 800 kilohertz, um, that sort of passes through the whole line. And within it, each individual pixel is addressed. And so you can say, okay, pixel one be this green, pixel two be this red, pixel three be that green again, and so on. And so you can string together hundreds of these pixels in a row um, and control them that without having individual control lines. Um, WS2812 says Chris, except for the original LED single color strings. Ah, yeah. So those might be 2011s or similar. So let's see. I've done one, two, three control lines here. Uh, I think is all I need to do. So I will. Oops. Well, I've managed that bit of wire, but I will trim that off. This is another. <laughs> I, if you are, you know, if you're doing a project like this, I don't really use wire strippers for um breadboarding projects i just you know i have my flush cutters out to trim the wire with and i just use the flush cutters to do the stripping part of that is because my flush cutters have a little notch in them let's see if we get a focus there from some previous accident with them so that makes a pretty decent wire stripper for bell wire anyway um it does leave a burr on the wire which means it's not the kindest to my breadboards or arduinos as we may have noticed but um but that is what it is 5,355 channels of control, says Chris. That's that's awesome. All right, I'm just going to record my remaining um, control channels over here. So D4 is A8, D3 is A9, and D14, because we're on Omega, is A11. Is that right? So I've got 0 through... 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Where's address? Oh, address pin 10. I need to wire up as well. We'll do that. So we will make one more wire here. Let's use this guy. Strip the ends. Chris, that is a simply ridiculous <laughs> amount of Christmas lights. I mean, I'm, I'm stunned. I'm very impressed. Matrix is... Oh, jeez, the Matrix... Welcome to the Matrix. All right, so A10 is going to be digital pin 15. Is A10. Okay. Uh, we will save this as uh, Mega RAM Test. Dino. Okay. So those are our address pins. Now we got to wire up our data pins. Uh, and then we'll have a couple more things and we'll play on from there. So these are going to be my data pins here. So IO. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight all are going to need to get connected in. But thankfully, I can use pre made wires for most of that. So let's start here. So, digital pin 16 goes to. Ah, I can already see I've wired this wrong. I put my ground in the wrong spot. There we go. Uh, so 16 goes to IO1, goes to 
Ohio one digital pin 17 goes to IO two digital pin 18 yes goes to IO three Oh, let's see if he's going to reach digital pin 19 goes to IO8. So that's five up in the bottom. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, just barely. 19 goes to IO5, or IO8 rather. Digital pin 20 goes to IO7. Digital pin 21 goes to IO6. Digital pin, now this is where I'm going to get down to this bit of the header. So this is going to be pin 22. I'm, I'm down here. Digital pin 22 is in IO5. And digital pin 23 is IO4. Okay, and that's what my list of, of inputs and outputs looks like here. Okay, I think that is almost entirely wired up. I have a couple more control lines. Um, specifically, I'm going to need my write, enable, and chip select lines to be correct. So, um, write, enable, I think, is always going to be... Well, write, enable, we're going to want to have control of as well. So... I'll explain what that is in a second here. So write enable, which is pin 27. I really, if I had thought this through a little bit more, I would have, pro well, I would say I would have prototyped this ahead of time. But frankly, like part of the whole point of doing these like casual off week streams is that I, I don't do that much prep for them. Um, so yeah. I had a really fun, so last week when we were working on Demi-Lite stuff, I had, I'm, as you probably noticed, I had a, a frippin' blast, and I went to Mary, my wife, who you saw earlier, and was like, oh man, this is great, I should do, you know, one of these casual things every week, and she was very good about saying, you know, only, only do them when you have something you're really excited about, because you don't, I, part of the reason of going to every other week for the classes was that but with that and work and the universe and life and COVID and all this stuff, it was just, it was too much. Um, and Mary good about encouraging me to say, Hey, you know, if you want to do something on a given weekend, um, because it's fun, because it's exciting, because you want to see the people that you like to see on Sunday nights. Great. But don't force yourself to do another Sunday night thing. Just, just to do it because, then you'll just burn out on that like you were burning out on not burning out i was doing fine but like then you 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 will be as stressed by that as you would be by the classes um so the point the, really the point is my wife is very smart uh so i've now got my right enable wired up so that's going to be digital pin 25 is my right enable what else do i need to squeeze in here output enable output enable i will need and chip selects, I don't think I need, but I will need to wire them to some power and some ground. So let's get output enable wired up here. Um, a little bit of bell wire. Which is not to say that I, I ever don't have a good time on these Sunday nights. I really, I really do. Um, but if, you know, if the inspiration to, to do a particular project hadn't struck this week, then I, I, you know, I'm, I'm no promises that these will be every Sunday is all I'm saying. But, but for now, I'm, I'm having a, a delightful time squeezing them in because there's always more projects to work on. It's a good excuse to like work on, work on some of these fun things that have been cooking. So write enable or no output enable will be pin 26 and then the chip selects. So the idea of these these CS pins here, these chips, chip select pins, is that um, you see one of them is active low. We can tell by the bar over it on the, uh, let me zoom in a little bit here on this pin out. The bar over a, a pin designator means active low. So this chip select pin will be active when we pull it to ground. This one will be active when we pull it high. The idea is you could have multiple of these chips all wired basically in parallel with the same output pins, the same address pins, and so on. And then you would manipulate their chip select pins to only basically turn on one, one chip at a time in your circuit makeup. 
Um, so in this case, I'm just going to say this is the only chip that I'm interested in talking to. I'm going to leave it active all the time. Um, so I'm going to tie pin 20 to ground and pin 26 to 5 volts. Uh, when you start digging into the data sheets for um, these chips, what you start to notice is that they are, you know, sort of designed for um, various, they're designed very smartly so that like, you know, if, if you have a RAM chip that's meant to sit next to, say, one of these video display chips, the RAM chip and the video display will be set up so that they can share chip select pins, but they will have sort of different values of high and low that enable them. So you, you, they basically sort of do the circuit design for you. So like this one needs one low and one high input in this order to enable. Maybe the ROM that matches up with this RAM would need one low and one high or something like that. Like they do sort of some of this system design for you in the chip design. Ooh, this is starting to look a little, a little freakish, huh? All right, so I have my address lines, I have my data lines, I have my write enable and my output enable. Do I possibly, no, that's, that's all the pins. That's all the pins that there are. So I think that's that's the only thing that we can, can possibly need. Um, so let us see here, what do we do about a write sequence? So data out valid. So I'm gonna set the address then Mm, then I might have to wire up these chip selects too. Um, let's see, write cycle. Here we go. So this is one of those timing diagrams we were talking about earlier that shows you sort of the exact sequencing of happens. And say, so this is how I'm going to write data to this RAM, which is mostly what I'm going to be doing. I'm rarely going to be reading from it. So I'm going to set up my address first here. And I guess that cursor is not showing up great because it's uh, Adobe, thanks Adobe. Um, maybe if I make it a hand, that's a little better, huh? So I make set up the address first then I set the output enable pin high um, with the chip selects in their proper state. Then I take the output, the write enable pin low and then high. So I'm gonna set my address and my data. I'm going to turn off the output. Then I'm going to turn on the write enable then I'm going to turn off the write enable. Then I'm going to turn off the out, turn on the output, and that should write some data to the RAM. All right. Well, and then we'll we'll implement the read cycle separately. Okay. Very cool. So let's put that into code. So let's write a new bit of function. If you if you've been asleep while I have been you know wiring 25 different things into this RAM chip, I don't blame you. Welcome back. Ask questions. I need beer too. So let's create a new function uh, called write to RAM. And it's going to take, uh, let's see, I have 13 address lines, yeah? So it's going to take a byte representing the high address, a byte representing the low address, and a byte of data. All right, now we'll need some variables to hold our um, our data and our address lines here. Of course, we've just put them all in comments. We haven't put them into any actual structure yet. So let's do that now, I think. Let's break this up a little bit just to make it a little bit easier to work with. So here's our address lines. So uh, for each of these, I really want to say that uh, a space between byte and data. Oh, thank you, Nate. Yes, I probably won't capitalize data there. Um, let's see here. What's the best way to store all of this data? Um, I guess I don't necessarily need to break these up as bytes. But well, let's, let's make the variables first, and then we'll think about that. Um, so we will say int address pins, uh, which is an array, and that's going to be um, these values in order of their addresses. Um, so in this case, it's going to be, so A0 comes first, so that's D5. Address one is D6, D7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, was address seven, address eight was D4. 
d3, address 10 is d15, address 11 is d14, and 12 is d13. Okay, so those are my address pins, and I will just create a variable num address pins is 13, just because that seems like a useful thing. Um, we'll break this comment up as well, um, and we'll define a, an array to hold our data pins. So int data pins equals, and again, this, this will be an IO order and we'll give it the pin number on the Arduino. So 16, 17, 18, these are all just in order, right? So 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Um, int num data pins equals eight. So again, just a useful thing to have. Um, int pin write enable equals 25 and int pin output enable equals 26. Okay, so to write some data to the RAM, the first thing I'm going to need to do is set up my address and my data, I suspect. So I want to be able to specify, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to use a long integer as an address. Um, and what I'm going to do is say for int, this would be much like the code we wrote earlier to cycle through um, binary values, from i equals zero to num address pins i plus plus, um, the value to write is equal to bit read of the address, um, and we'll get the ith bit of it and we will digital write that value out to the ith address pins, which I did camel case, yes, in this case, because I'm being inconsistent as always, address pins i, value to write. Um, so we'll set up the address. Uh, we will, uh, I guess we should probably set up the data after we are set up to write things, just so we're not conflicting with anything else that might be happening. So here in our write sequence, I'd, this is telling me I need to set up my address, then output enable should go from low to high, then write enable should go from high to low. Okay, so that's telling me that in our setup, after we do everything, the output enable should probably start as should start as low in here, and the right enable should start as high, which is disabled in this case. We don't want to be writing to it all the time, which makes some sense. All right, so we're set up our address here. Then our output enable goes from low to high, and our right enable goes from high to low. And I. I could look at what these various, so what this diagram is really telling us is how long we have to wait in between each of these individual states before it will be ready to take the next step, right? So this is saying from this point in time to when the output enable, you know, goes from low to high, or say from when the address is set up correctly to when write enable is allowed to go low is this value here. And I could go look that up, but it's going to be some number of nanoseconds. Um, so for the sake of testing, I'm just going to say uh, delay one millisecond, tons and tons of time, um, as, as far as the RAM is concerned. It, it can be read, read to very, very quickly and written to very, very quickly. I, at this point in testing, I'm not going to be that picky about it. So I'm just going to wait a millisecond. We'll be fine. So I'm going to set up my address pins. I'm going to take uh, the output enable pin uh, high, right, to disable the outputs, wait another millisecond. I'm going to take the write enable pin low to enable the write, and then I'm going to set up my data. So I'm going to say for int four, int i equals zero, uh, i is less than num data pins i plus. I guess this is going to be eight. It's always going to be eight data pins. We're storing the data as a byte, i plus um, plus, int value to write equals bit read, and what did I call that variable? Data, my input is data, pin i, and digital write data pins i value to write. So again, so we're gonna take the, the individual bits of this byte that we're passing into this function and put them on the output data pins. 
um, then I'm going to delay a little bit longer to let that data settle in. And then uh, I want to take my write enable back from low to high and then take my output enable low. So I will digital write. My write enable will go, write enable will go high to make sure that we're not writing any new data and we'll lock, we'll lock that data in place. Again, we'll wait a millisecond, which is way overkill. And we will digital write a the output enable low um, to be outputting that data again. And let's wait one more millisecond just there. So that's a very basic bit of code to write some data to a particular place in RAM. So what's going to be a good way to test that? I mean, we go through and like put an LED on each of those pins, but I feel like you don't want to sit and watch me put like 20 billion LEDs on there. So let's um let's write our, our read function as well, and then we can test them both. Actually, I guess let's first, let's see if this compiles or where I've made typos. No typos. Oh man, things are going so very, very well. So write cycle two. Uh, other ways you can write if, you're, if your output enable is constantly enabled. Let's see. Presumably my read cycle is just setting up the address and it will um, it will display that address on the bus. So let's um, let's in fact, we're just going to um, create a uh, set address function long address. That's just going to set up our address pins to set it to a particular address. So we'll say four uh, equals zero and so on and so on. Uh, and then uh, we'll create a function called uh, read. Uh, I actually don't really need that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write uh, some data to a place in the RAM, and then I'm going to read it back, and hopefully it will work. So I should probably do a little bit more setup here to make sure the pins are configured correctly. I'm going to say four int i equals zero, uh, i is less than num address pins, i plus plus, uh, pin mode of address, uh, what did I call that, that array? Address pins. Called it address pins, i is an output, Four int i equals zero. I is less than eight. I plus plus uh, pin mode data pins. I is also an output. Great. Um, let's see here. And then I'm going to need to set up my write enable and my output enable pins as outputs as well. Pin mode pin oe is an output and pin mode, pin write enable is an output. Great. Okay, I wanna set those low and high respectively. So now I think we're ready to try something. So with that all set up, I can say, um, let's pick an arbitrary address in memory to write to. So we'll say long address to test equals, um, uh, I don't know. Some address. That seems totally valid. As long as it's less than uh, 16,000, that'll be an address we can write to. And you know what I really want here? I have my set address function here. I want to read a value back into memory so we can test this. So I'll say set uh, read from RAM long address. Uh, and the first thing I'm doing is do is we set the address pins to match that address. And then I'm going to basically write the inverse of this function to read that value back in. So I will say byte result equals zero. And then we'll loop over our data pins um, and we will say uh, if digital read data pins i equals high oh man, I'm goofing the syntax up with Python so, so badly, then if that data pin is high, I'm getting that, that value stored there has a high bit there, I will say uh, result plus equals, uh, God, I'm forgetting how you do exponentiation in Arduino. 
Well, we'll just go to the reference. You really are. This is like, like if you haven't gotten this vibe already, um, I like basically what I would do uh, on a normal evening of like working on one of these projects and coding, except that I'm doing it with y'all here um, and sort of sharing it as we go. So I, I don't know. It it's still really fun and cool for me to like hang out with y'all, and this is a kind of a new thing that I'm I'm trying. I guess I I, I hope it's interesting. Um, oh, exp, right? Pow. Pow is the function I want. Pow base exponent. Um, so it equals pow 2 to the i. Right? So I'm going to add the various powers of 2 to my result. And then I'm going to return the result from my function. Okay. And this actually returns a byte. So what I want to do is... Um, byte test number equals some byte. Uh, let's say it's uh, 161. So I'm going to write to RAM address to test. Oh, here, before we do that, let's just read from the RAM. We'll say print, uh, let's see, serial dot print line, um, read from RAM address to test and we'll see what happens to be in that position in ram when we boot things up all right we're finally i think ready to run some of this code after like 40 minutes of wiring and coding all right i'll make sure we've got the arduino mega selected here in the menu yes and it is port 5 okay Nothing. Nothing at all. Hmm. Curious. Why would that be, I wonder? Mm hmm. Are we getting hung up somewhere? I equals zero. I is less than... So one place you... So troubleshooting, right? Always interesting. One place you can get hung up is if your for loop never terminates, right? If I had said I starts at zero and goes down... Right, this for loop would never end, or I guess it would end when it, when the integers wrapped around back to positive numbers. Um, but barring that, those both look okay. That looks okay. Um, one thing. Oh, I didn't do my. That's here's what it is. Serial dot begin one one five two zero zero. Didn't open the serial port. Well, let's upload that again. See what happens. So it thinks there is a zero at that position, which is plausible, right? Ram booting up to all zeros is not unheard of. Um, so what I will do now is say, um, uh, write to Ram at the address to test and the test number. And then I should get that same number back out when I, when I read from it. One, five, nine. Interesting. Okay, so something's, something's gone. Something I think is wrong in the wiring. That's cool. Okay, let's see if we're always, I, okay. Uh, if you were here for the nerdery, we're, it's, we're back. I'm hoping, so, the, so I put the number 161 into RAM, I thought, and got back 159. I think what I'm going to find is that means that there is a problem with the with some of the wiring that connects is the bit that represents 2 between the Mega and the RAM chip. But to confirm that, what I'm going to do here is select some other numbers, uh, like... 58, for example, um, and if my theory is correct, when I run this code, I should get back mm, 55, not 56. Interesting. Okay, more study needed. How about 31? 28. So we're off by three. So it's possible that we have like an uh, an off by one error in here somewhere. Mm hmm. 31. Well, let's go with a bigger number. Let's try, uh, let's try the maximum value of a byte. Let's do 255 and see what that comes back as. 240, 249. Ooh, that's weird. Why would that be? We're off by six. And six is a weird number to be off by. 
Hmm. Okay. Digital read. Oh, you know what's happening. <laughs> you know what's happening. I'm not actually reading from the RAM at all. I've configured my, my pins as outputs, um, but in this case, they need to be inputs. So really what I want to do here is in my setup function, I will say my address pins are configured as inputs. When I need to read from RAM, um, I will reconfigure them as inputs. And when I need to write out to the RAM, I'm going to have to reconfigure them as outputs. This is not something we do a ton in, in a standard, standard Arduino programming, but it is totally valid to do to redefine what your pins are doing. Uh, could have to do with a delay, possible. Um, let's, let's see what's happening here. So really what was happening um, is it was not reading the state of the RAM. It was reading the state of the pins that I had set it to. And I'm not 100% sure that I've gotten it right yet. Let's see here. 31. 31 gives 59. You know what I should also be doing is seeing if the results are consistent. Right? If I, if, I, if I hit the reset button here, do I get 59 every time when I put in 31? I do. What happens if I put in 32, which would just be a single... This might be a more methodical way to test this, is sort of test a single bit at a time. No, no, Nate, keep it, keep it coming. I'll take, I'll take any suggestions. So 32. So let's, what happens if I just put in zero? Forty-six. All right, one. Uh, let's see. Let's be more methodical about this. So let's write ourselves a little loop to test this. Um, and we'll just do this all in the setup function because we're only doing this once. We'll say for int i equals zero, i is less than two fifty-six, i plus plus. Um, write to ram. Uh. Yes, okay. Write to RAM, add this particular address, um, write I, delay, I guess, a little bit. And and this this is just me sort of hedging my bets. It's really not necessary. But because things are going wrong, I feel like waiting a little bit there can't hurt. I might. I guess I might be wrong about that. But I guess we'll, we'll find out. So we'll say serial.println read from RAM. And why don't we have it, we'll print it, we'll have it print the number um, as it goes. Serial.print I, serial.print, have it some spaces, delay 10, and serial. So what this loop is going to do um, is for the numbers 0 to 255, um, try to write that address into memory then wait a tiny a hundredth of a second and then read from that same address in memory. Um, and I'm, this hopefully will give us a more, a more systematic overview of what, what's going on here, which will maybe lead us to a solution, um, which could be a wiring error or it could be a programming error, um, but hopefully we'll, we'll learn something. Okay, so it's gonna take a second to spit out all of those and we will then go back up and see what happens. So starting from zero, I guess, let me, let me uh, serial dot print line. We'll just start with a blank line. Actually, we'll start with uh, some dashes here so we can see where we're starting. So we'll upload that, we'll run it again, and hopefully things will become clear. That data filling the screen there. Okay, so what do we know? Well, so the first thing that jumps out at me is that the number is never less than 46, which is interesting. And it's never greater than 249, which is six less than it should be. Now, 46 is what is 32 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 so everything but the 16s bit interesting uh address pins are outputs data pins are inputs 
when we're writing to the RAM, we're defining everything as an output. I mean, this is this is silly, but let's put a tiny delay in here. Shouldn't need to, but sure. Read from RAM, defining our inputs. Uh, we'll put a delay in here. Mostly because I'm like, I'm not sure if there needs to be some small amount of time before like the input and output modes are standard. I don't, I don't, like I say, I don't think that there is, but it, it seems like a valid hedge. Um, so we're setting up our data here, right to RAM. Dev and I value to write. Now that seems fine. Then write enable goes high and then output enable goes low. Uh, is that right? Output enable high first and write enable going low second. Let's look at that write array logic here. Oh, that's our read cycle. Oh, let's look at our read cycle. Output enable goes low. I mean, that's, that makes sense that we'd need the output to be active. Ah, but output enable should should still be low, but let's make that explicit. Um, digital right pin OE low there. Uh, chip select one is active low, chip select two is active high. Yes, and delay 10 milliseconds. I think that's, I mean, I, that shouldn't, Nothing should have changed there, so let's just verify that it doesn't. And if it does, we will have learned something. Yeah, again, so we got, those are not. Behaving as they should. Yeah, so it's like the one, two, four, eight and 32 bits are never being read as low. Which is interesting. They're always being read as high or they're always being output as high. Can you use the bit read function on a long integer, I wonder. I don't know. Unsigned long long. Our 32 bit variables, ah, okay. But not a long, long. Okay, so 32 bit variable should be fine. Digital write address pins i, value to write. The nice thing about, I mean, if I, because the address pins are more or less arbitrarily ordered, right, because they each sort of slice the address space in half, even if I've got these numbers, the address pins in the wrong order, it, it doesn't matter. The data pins do matter, so I might want to check that in a second here. Um, five, six, uh, yeah, so let's see. So I O, oh, but these are all just in order, 16 through 23. So that shouldn't matter. And again, again, if I'd gotten them out of order, they would read and write the same value. So what is happening here? Oh, wait a minute. Well, okay, first of all, let's try somewhere else in memory just to make sure our results are consistent across addresses. They are. Uh, yes, they are. Which is good. If this was address dependent, I'd be really sad, but it's not. So what's the pattern? So we go from two, 243 to 244 and nothing changes. So 239 and 255 are the same. And those are values separated by 255 and 239 are separated by 16. 
So it's like the, yeah, like some of these values are just not changing, which is strange. It's not, I mean, that they could be a wiring error, but I don't see anything like plugged into, um, you know, like two things plugged into the same position, which is what I would sort of expect to be the error. So is it a programming error? Did I typo something in the write or read methods? Address pins or output? Okay. Mm -hmm. Write to RAM. I equals zero. I is less than eight. I plus plus data pins I. Make this an output. For I equals zero. I is less than the amount of I value by equals bit read of the address, the ith value. To write to address pins I value to write. No? Okay, uh huh. Now, let's see here. Let's try moving this data setup to before we change the input and output pins. Before we, and before we do the write enable. Let's see if that makes a difference. Yeah, let's reset this. We see what's going on here. Same behavior. So the 1, 2, 4, 8, and 32-bit pins are never low, and I don't know why. Um, well, you know, one thing we might try, since these are sort of old, new old stock, as it were, is using a different chip, using a, literally a another 6264 just to like eliminate, I don't think it's gonna be that, but let's eliminate that as a variable. Um, I'm gonna very carefully take this out with my high-tech mechanical pencil tool. There, you can buy, um, and it's, it's a tool I have been meaning to buy, um, IC remover pliers, which have like little hooks on the end. So you can pull the chip straight out instead of sort of levering it out and risking bending the pins. Um, but. I don't own a pair of those yet. Let's see here. All right, so that's where that goes. Uh, yes. Now, what is meant to be attached to, what is pin one? No contact, oh good. Okay, so <laughs> just uh, to a sanity checking myself here, you can see this pin one says NC, no contact. Nothing plugs in there, which is great. Because nothing was plugged in there. I was like, is that, that seems wrong. Um, but apparently it's not wrong. All right, let's plug that back in and we will run our code, oops, again. Yeah, same result. So what, ah, okay, so here's a thought. Um, those bits are Oh no, all of my, so what I might, my, oh, hi, you're over here. <laughs> my thought was, um, would those bits that correspond to one, two, four, eight, and 32 be like in a different spot on the physical Arduino Mega than the others? Like, is there a different header that they're on and I'm somehow not addressing that right? But no, they're all in a sort of this extended non Arduino Uno address space which is strange. Um, well, other, other I'm, I'm, I'm sort of grasping at like what to try next. Other good practices that we could implement though are putting some bypassing close to the chip. All right, we could uh, add a capacitor there in case it's a like power supply issue. Ooh, I, think I've, I think I've reset my Arduino by doing that. So this may not update, I might not upload correctly here. Oh, there we go. Got confused for a second. So now if we open our serial monitor again. Yeah, same thing. I'm hoping it's not some really dumb programming error, but I that's kind of what it's feeling like. Right to RAM, okay. 
Bytes address. Data pins output. Zero to them address pins. Set the address to the bit corresponding to. That addressing seems to be working because that value is changing. And I'm not doing something dumb like reusing my serial pins, right? I deliberately didn't use pins one and two because those are the serial port that I knew I was going to want to use. And I'm naming my variables correctly. Yes, data I, digital write, data pins I, value to write. Let's, let's sanity check ourselves a little bit here. Um, let's... Let's uh, print out what we're writing as well as what we're reading. So not just what we should be writing, but what we are writing. So by, to do that, I'm going to take this write to RAM statement. I'm going to have it return a byte. And uh, I'm going to use the same logic from my uh, my reading function down here to generate that return value. So I'm going to say um, if bit read data i equals one, oops, equals one, add a value of two. So I can, I should, what we should have is, what we should have is three sets of numbers. Oh, oh, <laughs> helps if I actually return anything, huh? Um, return result and upload. Hmm. Oop, there we go. Ah, okay, so something is off here, it looks like. I'm going to, just to speed this process up a little bit, I'm going to uh, reduce my, my safety delays here by a little bit, just so we can get through these rules a little bit faster. Let's see here. And open the serial monitor. There we go. So what I'm looking for here is do these first two columns match? And no, they don't. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, that's part of the mystery. Let's go back to the top. So for one through s Does, can you not do two to the zero equals one? Is that what part of our problem is here? Let's look at the reference for this POW function in the Arduino reference. Show me, show me how your POW function actually works. Because I'm counting on two to the zero being one, but it sure isn't acting like it, huh? Like why, so, oh man. Okay, look at this, so, Oh no. Oh no, no. So zero, one, and two are correct. Three is correct. Four is not correct. Four is off by one. 12 is off by two. Where do we get off by three? 30 is off by three? That doesn't make any sense. Thirty is off by three. What in the whole hell? Nah, well, okay, now which talk to me more about bit read, your bit read function. Bit to read starting from least significant. Okay. If 
the zeroth bit is i plus equals two to the i. So the zero bit is one, we add one. The two, th the second bit is one, we add two to the one, which is two. Okay, so that should be, that should be right. killing me here y'all but i really want to solve this i i this is this is making me crazy so why is bit read why is four not working so four all right let's let's dig a little deeper y'all so Serial dot begin one one five two zero zero serial dot so, so let's see num equals two fifty five and we'll say four here let's just copy and paste our loop here or int i equals zero and I will say print uh, serial dot print line bit read of our number and I and don't need a return statement so I'm just gonna basically print out the the in theory the the binary representation of this particular number and we can figure out what the heck is going on with this statement. Uh, this is going to be called bit read test dot I know. Uh, we will upload that. Ooh, num was not declared. Sure, byte. Byte is fine. Uh, needs a semicolon. Uh, this needs a semicolon. This also needs a parenthesis. Parenthesis? All right, that's correct. Let's take number four. should be yes because we're going from least to most significant zero zero one is four let's actually let's let's make this print out the right way uh greater than or equal to zero and we'll start at digit the, the seventh bit and we'll subtract uh greater than or equal to zero so this should print out four in binary. Boom, great. This should print out uh, 128 in binary. Because that's kind of the crux of this whole program is that we're taking a number uh, and getting its sort of binary representation. Okay, so that does work. So what is happening? Byte data. Is it that I'm like over overwriting some, some variable? plus equals pow two. Is it this pow function that's screwing me up? Base and exponent. The result of the exponentiation, which is a, ah, okay, so that's interesting. So it's a double, which I don't want. Ah, I want this to, so I think this might be rounding errors throwing me off, maybe. Let's go back to our test program, uh, bit read test. Um, so we will say result equals zero, um, and we'll sort of replicate that same code. If bit read num i equals one, result plus equals pow two i print line, uh, and we'll just print out the result dot print line result uh-huh upload and ah result was not defined uh, needs a semicolon as well if this is a uh typing a uh, type you know error i will be uh frustrated but validated because that is squirrely yes okay so i so here so here's a smoking gun i put in 128 and it gave me back 
the correct binary representation of 128, but it also told me it was 127. And I hate that. So what happens if I, if, if I let results take fractional values, if I make it a double, right, and now I put it out? Ooh, it's 128.00. Uh, but let's print the result and then we will print a little space and we will say serial. So, so I think what is happening is when, when that result is an integer, it is being rounded slightly at each of these steps, which is causing, uh, inaccurate results. So, and, oh, and especially if it's a byte. So I'm going to say in each of these cases, that the result that we're calculating for the time being, and this is gonna throw some things off, should be a, uh, a double, which is a kind of floating point, you know, a decimal number. Um, and that's gonna, not really what I want to do, but that's, it says we're, all we're doing with that value currently is printing it. Um, I think this will be illustrative. Okay, okay. Whew. Okay, so the value that we're putting into the RAM is the same value that we're calculating that we should put into the RAM. Oh, and these values have changed. Ah, okay. So they're still not correct, but we are also being screwed up by those rounding issues, right? So, so, two, so when all the pins should be on, they are all on. Let's look at the low end. It's uh, zero is coming back as 48. So the, so the pins representing the 16's place and the 32's place are uh, always coming back as high. So that's something we can work with because then we can figure out what those pins are. So those pins are the 1's place, 2's place, 4's, 8's, 16 and 32 are digital pins 20 and 21, which are this. You probably can't see them super well, but I can zoom you in a little bit so you can. That's this orange pin and this black pin here, which interestingly are SDA and SCL. I don't know if that would be screwing anything up. It shouldn't be, but but maybe. Uh, those are going to these two pins here. We'll check our data sheet. Uh, oh, you know... Oh, ah, maybe I have goofed some of my wiring here because those are what should be, let's see, chip select is there. So that's address pin eight. So eight, seven, six, five, four. So yes, I think I have an ordering issue. So let's double check the ordering of my data pins. Oh, if I had read them just a little bit more clearly, I would have seen that I have a problem with my data pins. So it should be 16, 17, 18. Uh, let's see, I have one, two, three, four should be 23, five should be 22. Six should be 21, seven should be 20, and eight should be 19. Oh, oh. All right, so, oops, well, still not correct. <laughs> but closer, I mean, not closer, that's, that's pretty rough. Um, but, interesting, okay, so let's, let's verify those. So, data pin... Let's split screen this again with my data sheet here. <sighs> in the home stretch of solving this problem, which I feel just great about. Haven't taken a beer break in a while. Not a ton of questions, I imagine, because it's just been me troubleshooting for hours and hours. But thanks for hanging out with me while I do. It's fun It's fun to do this knowing there are people out there. Um, so hopefully, hopefully you're gaining some knowledge by osmosis, if not by demonstration. Okay, so let's double check our pin, pinage here. So IO1 is fourth in the bottom on this side. So that's this blue here. So that's 16. Yes. 
IO2 is 12, which is that yellow wire, which is 17, yes. IO3 is this green wire, which is 18, yes. IO4 is the bottom here, is that green wire. That should be 23, yes. IO5 is this blue wire, which should be 22, yes. IO6 is this black wire, which should be 21, yes. IO7 is this orange wire, which should be 20, yes. And uh, IO8 is this blue wire, which is 19. Yes, that is accurate. Hmm. Interesting. All right, let's let's re-upload and just double check. I guess let's double check that I know what's happening here. 16, 17, 18, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19. Okay, that is accurate. Let's reset this. And let's let's re-deduce where the error is. So when everything is on, when we're at 255, everything is accurate. 254 is accurate, so we know the, let's make a little chart. Let's sketch on the back of this data sheet. So pins that we know are good. So we know the ones pin is accurate. Uh, 253 is correct. Uh, let's see. What is what is zero? Zero is ninety six, which is sixty four and thirty two. Are some of these pins inverted? Am I crazy? Are they active low? This would be a good thing to check, right? Are, are some of these pins active low? Um. Uh, let's see, chip deselection, oh, you are, okay, good. Mm -hmm -hmm. Timing diagrams, data retention current. TTL compatible. I, I wouldn't think they're active low. Let's see. Right enable, just like low, right enable, right enable, low. So now it's as if the pins corresponding to 32 and 64 are always high. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. So pins 21. That's those same two pins. Look, so the pins I was having an issue with earlier were this red and black wire down at the bottom here, which are always reading high. So I'm I'm gonna just swap to two other pins. I, this might be like a hardware issue, an Arduino mega hardware issue, or, I, or maybe an issue with my specific mega. It's not It's not new out of box, that's for sure. So that's going to become 26 and 27, respectively. So 20 and 21 become 26 and 27. 26 and 27. Let's just verify that. So 26 should be going to IO7, which is fourth in the bottom on that side. So... 26 goes to one, two, three, four. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, this is, this is plausible. I mean, that the, the issue followed the hardware, which is bizarre, 
which makes me think it's a hardware issue. Oh, look at that. Oh, no. Don't look at that. <laughs> Shice. What have we got wrong now? We're off by 64. In some places. So this was all accurate. Accurate, 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 accurate. We got to 64. And things reset. So... The, so Pin 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. So pin the, representing 26 is not... Oh, well, maybe this is just not plugged in well enough. That might also be an issue. It's kind of hanging out of the breadboard there. That's the problem with some of these pre-made DuPont wires is the wires aren't, aren't big enough to make a great contact. Oh, our fingers crossed. Oh, no. Yeah, so the the 64's pin, which is this orange this orange wire here, is not is not ever going high, which is strange. Maybe it maybe it's a bad jumper wire. That's not impossible. Let's take out this jumper wire and replace it with a bit of bell wire. Let's just cut out the middleman here. Oh, this is oh so okay. This is a as I'm stripping more wire on stream. This is a good moment to like reflect on what this troubleshooting process has been, right? We wrote the code that should have worked, it didn't work. What did we try first? And in my mind, there are a couple different ways you can go about troubleshooting, right? You can either, and we've kind of done both, right? You can either try and, you know, go to the methodical step-by-step -step method right away, you know, sort of work your way from one end of the pitch to the other, or you can um, sort of start somewhere in the middle of your chain of, of logic and with something that's most likely to be the problem, right? Like in the theater world where we have, you know, bulbs going out all the time, right? If if a light is not turning on and should be, it's not unreasonable to start by checking the bulb, right? Even if that's kind of in the middle of the chain of troubleshooting, it, it, the odds of it being a bulb are high enough that it's worth starting there. Well, you can't see this on the screen here, but we're still missing that 64's bit. That's so strange. Um, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. Well, I'm gonna change that. I mean, it. Oh. Oh no. Uh, just to continue chasing this hardware issue down, um, I'm gonna take my multimeter and I'm gonna meter and see if I have a valid connection to the pin on the flash on the uh, the RAM here. I'm gonna meter the other end of this wire or am i going to meter the header i'm going to meter the header that's four positions in on the inside so what i'm doing here is i'm coming in with my multimeter which is in bp mode be kind of a oh, let's do the wire first because i'll again this will be the easier test uh we will go to that pin okay so i do have continuity there let's just let's i don't know let's go to pin 32 let's just change it up in 32. Upload that. Check the serial monitor. Hope that we have solved the problem. Yes, we have. All of those numbers match each other. So, so, so we were having some hardware issues as well as some software issues that were masking them. We were having a software issue where because the POW function, the exponentiation function was returning a floating point number that we were casting as an integer and that was prematurely rounding it off. We were seeing some spurious results in our math. And also apparently some of the pins on my Arduino Mega don't output, which is possibly because it's old. Wow, that is frustrating, but on the flip side, maybe informative, maybe useful. I feel like, so this is, I mean, 
this is the kind of stuff that I go through every couple of weeks when we're prepping for class. It's like, oh, the thing is not working. Yes, Nate, I fixed it. I can't believe it. It's been literally like an hour, maybe more, <laughs> maybe, maybe 45 minutes, which is not necessarily what I intended to do tonight. But we are successfully writing and reading data to and from this RAM, which is pretty cool. So let's do, let's do, now that we have the code working, let's do one bit of validation just to show that it works. And then I will probably call it for the night because it's been 90 minutes uh, almost twice over at this point. But just, just to show that we really are able to store data in this RAM module, let's let a little bit of code that uses the code that we have now because it will feel quite good. All right, so let's blow away our, our test code here and do something more interesting. So let's write, so the, our, the Arduino, you remember, only has um, uh, a small amount of RAM built into it. I think it's two, 2K of RAM um, in the 32.8. Um, so let's use our external 8K of RAM and store a bunch of data in it. Um, I guess it'll, it tells us how much RAM it has. How much, how much RAM do you have? Uh, it'll tell us in the compilation because it's going to set aside some RAM right off the bat for um, global variables. Uh, ah, 8K. Oh, right, it's the 32.8, of course, yeah. So the Arduino has, uh, has its own 8K internal RAM buffer. So let's use 8K of external RAM, and we'll read that back in. So I will say for int i equals zero, i is less than 8192, eight kilobytes, i plus plus, uh, write to RAM uh, at address i, and what should we use as our data? Um, let's say we're going to write the value um, Uh, here, let's do, uh, this will be easy. We'll just do I mod, uh, 256, right? And then, uh, I'm going to delay a little bit. I'm going to say four int I equals zero. I is less than a 192. I plus plus. Re, uh, serial dot print line, read from RAM at the address I. Okay. So what this should do is write uh, a value to every address of that RAM, wait half a second, and then read it all back. And here, while, while it's writing, I will have, have it print out what, val what, um, what line it's on and what value it's writing there. So I'm just gonna print uh, I, serial dot print some spaces and serial dot print line i mod 256 mod 256 all right and then it's going to come back and it's when it prints it's going to print uh what line it's reading from serial dot print line begin read here here and then it's gonna print out what it's reading from RAM. So hopefully, hopefully after all this, it's going to write eight kilobytes of data to the RAM, pause a moment, uh, and then read those exact same values back out. And that will, will tell us that we have, we have succeeded, hopefully, hopefully. Upload. Oh, well, if I get my semicolons right, we will hopefully succeed. <laughs> Upload. Oh, oh. Uh, print lint, not a thing. Print line is a thing. Okay, uploading, open serial port. All right, so now it's jamming through. It's gonna write uh, the values from zero to 256 over and over again until it gets to 8K uh, of RAM. And we'll, we'll, we'll jump back over to it when it does. Hey, yeah, this is a good time to mention. I, I know it's in the banner below, but if you haven't voted, go vote. <laughs> it's time, <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> Drink water, get sleep, take care of yourselves, and vote. It's it's, it's important, uh, and it couldn't be easier. In many places, actually, I should say I'm very privileged to live in a place in Chicago where it is very easy to vote. I hope it is very easy to vote where y'all are. Um, I don't know if our our friend from Belgium is still here. If you are, I hope I hope you have something important to vote on. Then you vote soon. Nation is valid yesterday. Yes, 
vote is more important than water. Yes, voting voting is critical. I would I would give up all every beer I've ever drunk for Electronics Bash uh, to vote, and I have voted. Voted in person here in Chicago. Took a 25 minutes in and out. Real good social distancing. You know, people are generally doing. That's this is my takeaway. Not this is not political at all. This is my takeaway from the past eight months. People are generally doing pretty darn good at being good. Um, and then there's just some jerks who ruin it for everybody. So go be one of those good people like the rest of us and and vote. All right. So now we're reading from Ram. Oh no, it's all zeros. Why is it all zeros? Oh no. That's no good. But it was starting to read the right data. All right, well, here, I'm going to unplug the USB cable. Let's see, where does my read start? Read begin here. 255. Huh. Huh. Why? Why would it be doing that? Let's just double check. I've got my right to address and data. Yes, address. I mean, I guess I could, oh, you know, I could make, I could make these longs in case that's confusing it. And I guess I could make these cast these values that it's writing to bytes just in case that's confusing it uh oh no just just that top one oops well helps if i plug the arduino back in there you go whoever had money on me forgetting to plug in the power supply i feel like you get a, a half point for forgetting to plug the arduino back in before trying to program it Double check com port. Might have to restart the IDE here in a second. Now there we go. Okay, zero port. All right, we're writing. Let's try this again. I really want to have cracked this. Oh, oh no, that's right. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think this is going to work, but I think I said the same thing last time. So, because we're going to call it a night after this is successful, um, I, here's a little prelude of the next step on this project, which I may just move ahead on or I may do on stream, um, or but we will see. The idea of using this RAM is that you write some data into it with your microprocessor and then you have your display chip. Hey, remember this display chip we were working with for the first half of this thing? You have this, it has its own set of address pins. It sets its, an address in a RAM that it's interested in and reads that value out to the video chip when it needs it. The challenging thing is that, of course, you can't be writing in from your microcontroller and reading it into the video chip at the same time. So you have a few options for what to do there. You can either sneak in writes to the RAM in between clock cycles of the video chip. You would basically say, write, read, write, read. Um, and of course, in a um, in an older system, right, we're going to use this RAM chip just as video RAM, right? It's the only thing that's going to be reading it is this video chip. In a classic system, this RAM might be being used by lots of other things, like the microprocessor to like do calculations and programs and hold the stack and things like that. So you have to be really deliberate about when you access it and when you let the video the video chip access it. Um, what, I, what my intention is, is that, so we basically, we get a small break in time in between uh, every frame of video. Basically as the, the video finishes writing one frame of video, it has a certain number of milliseconds as the, the display sort of tracks back to the top to start again. And my idea would be to only write to the video RAM during that portion of time as it resets. And luckily there is a pin on the uh, video chip that goes low 
during that time period. So basically it would be to, if I want to update something on the display, wait until that pin goes low and then write new values to the RAM and then stop writing to them by the time the pin goes back high and we're outputting video again. So we're basically only accessing video memory when the video chip doesn't need to be accessing it. That's the theory anyway. More screwiness. Now, some of these values are correct in the middle of this range here. Oh, no. Let's see. Where does my read start? Let's see. Let's go back, go back, go back. Read starts here. 255. 64. That's so strange. Oh, do I have the same problem with my results being... Oh, no, this is the right test, right? This is the... These are doubles now. Which is what I want. Oh, that's so frustrating. I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. I'm so proud of figuring out that hardware issue and the math issue, but now we're, it's like it's not retaining any information. Well, okay. So let's let's narrow this down a little bit. Let's just not giving up yet, but I'm I'm running out of steam just a little bit. So let's let's just try writing to and from the first 64 values in our RAM. And they all evaluate to 63, which is the last value we wrote, which is interesting. Now, why would that be? Is my read from RAM function not correct? Read from RAM, we set all the pins as inputs, we delay, we set the address to the address we want to read, output enable. is asserted low. Yes, that's correct. Data pins I, result equals high, return result. Let's, let's break this down even more. So this is another strategy for troubleshooting, right? Is when the large scale thing is not working, do smaller and smaller test cases until you can isolate the result. So I'm just gonna do the, I'm gonna write a value to address zero, um, I wrote a zero, I read a zero. Okay, that's a that's a good sign if nothing else. Let's try one. So now we should do zero and one. So when I, yeah, so I'm always reading back the final value I wrote in. Why? Oh, you know? What I think I need to do, um, this, I will be frustrated if this is again the answer, but it's possible. Um, No, it was not. So the what I was thinking there, so in the I think I've mentioned this before, in the older version of the Arduino standard, the way that you would set a pull-up or a pull-down resistor was by digital writing to an input pin. And I was worried that perhaps by switching my pins back to being inputs, it was, uh, if those pins had previously been high, it was leaving them with a pull-up enabled and that was screwing with my results, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, I don't, this should not change anything, but just for gits and shiggles. Oops. It's weird. It's a weird upload cycle. Let's try that again. Zero, one, zero, zero. Interesting. 
So something screwy is going on between switching these back and forth between inputs and outputs. Let's print a serial.println start new run. Just so we can tell where things are starting and stopping, serial.println will put a blank line in between. Right, so right, so wow, that's weird. So I should be writing a zero to address zero, writing a one to address one. Then I should be reading a zero from address zero and reading a one from address one, but something is going very wrong in that changing the order of these two lines changes okay here's a thought Maybe I should be setting the address first, then changing my pins to inputs. I wouldn't think it would make a difference, but then again, I would have thought this would have worked. So clearly something is not right here. Nah, still zero, zero. And then if I change this order back to zero, one, I should, we'll get one, one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm always reading the last value that I wrote in. And for, but why is that? I'm switching all those pins to be inputs. Do they need to be pulled up? That doesn't sound right. Because they're TTL outputs on the RAM, which should, shouldn't need an input or an output or a pull-up. But let's double-check the data sheet. <sighs> My god. If I've not cracked this when we hit the turn of the third hour of this, I, I will call it, I will say. Um, because at some point there are diminishing returns in brain power. Yeah, a little side note here. You can see all the like times of, you know, uh, output enable to output valid, you know, 50 nanoseconds. Uh, chip select to output uh, goes to low impedance, 10 nanoseconds. So, like all of this delaying of milliseconds that I'm doing, way, way overkill. Probably superstition more than anything. Right cycle time. Uh, yeah, it's just standard TTL outputs. How strange. To be honest, this is the kind of thing I Google. The Arduino forums are an awful, awful place. I mean, okay, one last place to check, just because it's interesting. One last little little tidbit. Um, we're going to check the 18 mega 328 data sheet. 
and see if it tells us, and I don't know that it will, how much time has to elapse if you're changing from an output to an input if there is a minimum time gap that we have to have. Power management, system control, interrupts, IO ports. Selectable pull-up resistors. Configuring each pin. This this will harken back to our um our register access class that I think <laughs> put a few people to sleep because it was kind of math dense, but it's I think interesting. And when we're digging down to the hardware, like it is is useful to be familiar with. Yes, yeah, so if the register is written zero, it's an output. If it's zero, it's one. It's an input. Pull-up resistor. Switching between input and output. Switching between tri-state, which is uh, high impedance. Okay, this is interesting. When switching between high impedance and output high, an intermediate state with either pull-up enabled or output low must occur. Normally, the pull-up enabled state is fully acceptable and in a high impedance environment will not know that there's a strong driver high enough pull-up. If this is not the case, the PUD bit in the MCUCR register can be set to disable all pull-ups on all ports. Switching between input with pull-up and output low Hmm. So I think all this is saying is that if you have an uh, an input which is not does not have a pull up on it, and you try to jump immediately to an output high state, you're going to have some small intermediate state, right? Because you have to turn off the pull up, or you turn on the output and then make like there's going to be either a pull up and then an output, or an output and then a pull up. I don't think that's the issue I'm experiencing. But it is interesting. Software's on pin value. Unconnected pins. Alternate port functions. This is not really telling me what I want to know. And I could try doing this at a register level, but I don't think that's going to... Do it. So uh, this this is feels to me like um, I'll guess I'll double check the code one last time. But this feels to me like an Arduino, like some something is not um, some of the Arduino pins are not being reset correctly. Yeah, I don't know. I will totally admit to, to being stymied here at this point. And I'm, I think, running out of the brain power to be able to decipher it. So that's where, in a slightly, uns, in a very satisfying, if I'd called it 20 minutes ago, it would have been very satisfying. I think I have to call it here at a slightly less satisfying note, which sucks. But that's just what it is. I mean, I part of the, uh, it's something that like I just take on board when I come and like, hey, I'm going to try and do this live with y'all is that, Sometimes we'll get to the point where it works, sometimes it won't. Here, why don't we turn on our working demo back over here? That was so fun. Oops. Oh, shit. It's doing all kinds of exciting things. <laughs> oh, uh, power supply is on? Yeah. Wow. Wow. No, just bad sync. I mean, probably something is not connected that should be. Oh, you know what it is? The... Um, the Arduino's not on. Because <laughs> I unplugged it to plug in this Mega. So, of course, those pins are somewhat undefined, and it's freaking out a little bit. There we go. There's our old friend. This strange little graphics demo that I told you would make more sense when we got further in. Maybe it did, but maybe it didn't. <laughs> uh, well, with this scintillating little bits of pixels scrolling by here, I think that's where I uh, am going to leave you for this evening. Um, thanks for, thanks for hanging out. Uh, you know, 
I, I I do these bonus Sunday night ones like when I have something that I'm excited to work on. And this was this was though I'm frustrated, of course, as you always are when there's a project that you don't have working. I'm delighted to have shared this evening with some good good nerds. Nate, Chris, anyone else who's still out there, thank you for hanging out with me tonight. It's been a joy. Um, yeah, this has been delightful. Uh, go vote. Go wash your hands. Go hydrate. Get some good sleep. Um, next week, next Sunday night, uh, the 8th, it must be, 7 p.m. Central Time, um, we'll be back to the regularly scheduled Electronics Bash Raspberry Pi classes. Um, to you're talking about Python programming on the Raspberry Pi and fun things you can do with that. Um, I think, so the, the, I'm sort of circling around this idea. I, I know I threw out, like, user interface, um, things, which I, I, I don't know will exactly be the things, because, again, it's, it's kind of a stuffy topic. There's, like, a lot of little fiddly bits that I don't think will be super great. But we might talk about, like, making live updating graphs. I'm kind of inspired by my workshop mate, Martha, at the museum that I work at. Um, she's one of the technicians there. She recently made a live graphing system that updates based in, in real time based on some data. Um, and the library that's built around, which is matplotlib and numpy, which is a library that handles working with big numbers, are both really versatile. So we might we might find some way to like rope those into like, I don't know, graph how much smoke comes out of a moving light when you turn it on or graph like a heat measurement of something. I don't know. Some, some, I need some kind of demo to make it interesting and interactive, but... Um, but those are, those are two very useful functionalities, graphing and working with numbers in a more fluent way. So that's kind of where I'm circling. But as always, when the thing gets scheduled, uh, you'll know what I'm actually intending to do. Um, in any case, thank you all, uh, tremendously for, um, for hanging out here. Yes, I do have like an air quality sensor in one of these kits. So like maybe measuring air, like smoke is not necessarily a crazy thing, but we shall see. Thank you again. Good to see you good nerds. I'll see you next week. Take care, y'all.